everyone welcome to another brand new live episode of the outlaw nation show here on the outlaw nation channel i am the outlaw john roken i'm excited tonight uh to welcome back to the show a guy i've gotten to know over the years had many battles with but we found our peace our nuclear detente some might say between the outlaw and the beast as we move forward in life and i'm excited to have him back on the outlaw nation show Again, it's been a bit, uh, and so much has been going on in the world of entertainment, film, uh, the Oscars, all that. We're going to get into all of that with my guest, William Bibiani, in just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we like to do a little housekeeping right up top. Just want to say thank you all so much for joining us live right off the bat. All of you who come in right off the bat, waiting to come in, I appreciate you all even more because you want to enjoy every second of the two hours we will have on the show tonight. Uh, just want to remind you all as well, it's been a busy week here on the Outlaw Nation channel. Already dropped a West Side Story teaser trailer reaction video this morning. Going to drop my Mortal Kombat review tomorrow. Uh, Monday we had game time, so if you've missed out on that, it's available. You can also go to the Outlaw Nation podcast network to listen to all the shows we have on here. Tomorrow we'll be doing a live episode of The Jedi Way. I think Laura and I, Laura Kelly and I are kicking around, and I think we're going to revisit Rogue One. It's been a bit. It's been trending on social media for the last few days, so I think we're going to sit down and talk about Rogue One and hear your thoughts about it since we'll be live and bring you in there as well. And then also on Thursday, we'll be back with Impolite Truths and The Geek Buddies. Both those shows on there on Thursday as well. And then Friday, I'll be on SCN Live hosting. So a lot of stuff happening there and there's already movies coming out. So it's, it's just falling one on top of the other. How are you all doing? I hope you're getting vaccinated. I hope you're wearing your mask. I hope you're practicing your social distancing. Hope you've been enjoying the showdown matches as well that have been happening over the last few days and all that. I've got my tag team match coming up this week on Friday. Uh, we take on uh, Perry Nemiroff and Josh Horowitz of MTV fame. Um, the press room, that's what they're called. Me and JT proving if we can hang and uh, if we can live up to our name of Rushmore. It's going to be a lot of fun for sure uh, and uh, all of that. All right, but without further ado, because uh, I'm not sure how long we're going to have this gentleman on the show tonight. Uh, let me please welcome one of the co uh, the co-host of the critically acclaimed, the critically acclaimed podcast, uh, one of the Schmodown legends, a writer, a critic, one of the best reviewers out there. Uh, honestly, no bullshit. One of the best reviewers I've ever read uh, in my entire life, and he is also the owner and CEO. I hope I got that right. Of Salt Cat Soap Company, is that correct? You'll correct me if I'm wrong on that. But Salt Cat Soap Company, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome to the Outlaw Nation show the Beast himself, William Bibiani. What's up, go, Bibs? Go, go, everybody. Uh, <laughs> my my wife and partner, M. Lapis da Silva, is the CEO. Oh, okay. Just want to make All that right. abundantly clear of Salt Cat Soap. <laughs> I I got I I am a proud co partner in this endeavor, but she's. It's it's her baby, and she has turned it into something really magical. And uh, yeah, I will be talking a lot about soap tonight. So I hope you all <laughs> like soap. Uh, this is a honey oatmeal soap bar. It's made Ooh. with real honey and oatmeal. Uh, it is fabulous, very very uh, uh, natural and sweet. Uh, this uh -huh. is a lavender shampoo bar. Yeah, oh, it's a wow. bar of shampoo. It lathers, it lathers beautifully. We have okay. this in orange as well. And uh, I recently debuted this at the Free For All. These yes. are my chocolate strawberry lions. What? Yeah, this is chocolate ganache and strawberry, and they smell, well, they smell amazing if they weren't, you know, hermetically sealed. But in any <laughs> case, uh, we have a lot of soaps over at our Etsy store, Stealth Cat Soap, which is also Stealth awesome. Cat Soap on Instagram and Twitter. Nice. What 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 started this venture? What what was going uh, on yeah. uh, in in COVID that made you guys start this? Uh, or was this building for a while and they just found the impetus uh, to do it? It, it was this last year. Uh, mm. We were uh, you know we were trying to find ways to you know sort of fill the time. We're spending a lot more time at home. We don't get to go out and and um, uh, go on adventures. And yeah. we started looking at a variety of sort of crafting YouTube uh, sort oh. of. Uh, um, videos and right. uh, one of the things that we found were soap making videos and initially we watched these videos in order to relax there's something very pleasing about watching sure. people uh mix chemicals and you know make different colors and different designs and what we gradually realized is that a we're watching a lot of soap videos <laughs> and, and b 
it's actually like something we could do. Like mm. it's something that we both have. In, our, she in particular had a major artistic interest in it. I was interested yeah. as well. And we realized that it really wouldn't be impossible for us to get the materials together, make the initial investment and uh -huh. start making soap. And so within a few months, we had enough materials to get going, start making our designs. Uh, I made a few initial designs. Uh, she started, you know, really going completely uh, bananas, just absolutely making these incredibly beautiful, ambitious designs that I haven't seen anywhere wow. else like right off the bat. And uh, a few months after that, I mean, we talked about it on the Schmodown a little bit. People were mm -hmm. excited to, to try it. So we started our own Etsy store. And so far, uh, we've sold a lot of soap. People nice. have been giving us really positive reviews. People are enjoying them. They're they're really really nice soaps. They're they're great for gifts. Mother's Day, Father's Day is coming up, so we got uh, right. some nice treats that we're about to we're about to uh, release a whole bunch of new products on Saturday, uh, yeah. just in time for that. But we release new products on the first Saturday of every month. We usually drop a few surprises in the middle of the month, and we have a lot of uh, just standard. Uh, wonderful bars that are available all the time, uh, regardless. Yeah, um, well, and it's great. I, I would never have thought that here we would be doing this, but uh, here we are, and it's really nice, actually. Yeah, it's peaceful. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys yeah. do it? Like, do you guys make these soaps together? Do you have people you hire to do it? Like, no, no, no. What's we don't the have, process. There's, there's no hiring. We we do okay. not we do not make enough products, uh, nor do we sell enough product for that to be even remotely. Okay. Something we're thinking about these are like handmade artisanal. Wow products so we make them by I'm trying to think like the largest initial batch we ever had of anything was like 12 or 15 to start oh. um and uh but we then, then we can always make more it's not super complicated it's just right. takes effort and work and a bit of craftsmanship but um you know it's right now how it mostly works is she is designing the majority of the stuff at the store. I have a lot right. of other uh, projects that keep me distracted and don't let me focus as much on <laughs> creating new designs as I would like, as I host like a billion podcasts mm -hmm. over at the critically acclaimed network. Uh, but um, I do try to design at least a couple every month and I love doing it. Um, it's not really something you need a lot of teamwork on. Like we divide some of the uh, work on, but the actual pouring and stuff, it's not like, it's actually pretty intimate work and it doesn't yeah. need like a whole bunch of hands in the kitchen uh, to, uh, not, not that we do it in the kitchen, but like, you know, we don't need like a lot of hands on deck right, to produce right. a line of soap. So, wow. and you can, and if you're interested in this, there are videos online cool. of uh, uh, various, there's cold process, uh, soap. There's melted pour, which is what we do right now. Right. Um, and if you want, you can look online and you can see a, a, kind of how this is done. And um, it's it's great. Honestly, it's a nice mm -hmm. artistic project. And I made the mis I don't know if it's a mistake, but I uh -huh. realized uh, when I was young that um, I made this decision to turn what I loved into what my, my hobby into a job. You know, movies. Mm -hmm. This is what I love. This is what I care about. Right. And the problem is you reach a point when you're in like your 30s or whatever, and you realize that you don't have a hobby anymore. <laughs> Everything you right. do is connected to your work in some way. Yes. Even if I watch a movie that isn't something I'm supposed to be reviewing for a podcast, I'm thinking to myself, oh, this takes place in Rome. That could be a that could be a Schmodown question, you know, like <laughs> oh, in yeah. the back of my head, it's always That's a little bit of now. homework. <laughs> it's always a little bit of homework. So this yep. is something, even though it's it is an occupation, um, it is something that I can tune everything else out. Right, and that part is great. And so oh, I've got good. a few designs on there. The uh, the lions, these are mine. Uh, okay. I've got. Um, I think we just sold our last banana bar. I made a banana cream uh, bar, but I think we just ran out of that. And I also have uh, a version of this. I don't have it actually with me at the desk. Uh, I got something like these. It's a. It's a. Instead of a shampoo bar, it's a shave bar. Oh wow! And it's uh, it's made with espresso and honey. Uh, okay. And it just, it smells like a great cup of coffee in the morning and you just, you, they're, they're designed for shaving. I know it doesn't look like I shave, but I do tune this up a little bit. <laughs> um, and it lathers really, really nice. We just got a really good review from someone who had never tried uh, a shave bar before and they said okay. they really liked it. So uh, I hope people check that out. I know that's a little outside the wheelhouse for some people, but once you've tried a shampoo or a shave bar, um, it's a slightly different experience. I find it a lot less like greasy than a lot okay. of like over the counter shampoos. It's really right. fresh. It's nice. Now, so, what about yeah. what about people like like I've got dry skin and I know I've yeah. got I've got psoriasis. It, it isn't mm. bit it isn't bad or anything, but I've sure. got a couple of spots and stuff like that. I worry about the kind of because that can affect you if it dries out your skin too much. Or sure, that can bring on an outbreak. Do you guys have specialized soap or things like that? That are I don't think we have anything specialized right now, but we okay. do try to keep this like free from. 
um, any extraneous uh, uh, chemicals. Any extraneous chemicals. There's some chemicals involved yeah. in making soap. We can't avoid right. that. We we acquire the soap. The soap has been produced. Uh, but we're not trying to just jack this full of stuff. And you can see our ingredients list over at Etsy. It's all very, it's all right there. I myself nice. have a soap allergy. Um, oh, okay. I have, um, okay. there's a, I, I don't know exactly what it is, unfortunately, because it just wasn't worth um, researching it. Like to do like that big stick test to find out everything. Right. But right. Uh, I eventually found out when I was in my twenties that I am allergic to some weird chemical that is put in a lot of over the counter soaps. And if oh, I don't use glycerin then i just i get rashes it just wow. my hands get really red and it's annoying okay. so i need to use like a glycerin soap and i have been using almost nothing but like these soaps right um right. since we started making them and i have had no problems had no skin wow. problems whatsoever so okay. I, that's not me saying this is like some miracle cure for psoriasis or anything like that right, obviously right, right. No, no. not i don't make those things but these are soaps they are designed the way soaps are made that we don't do anything weird to them so i don't think you'd have any problems but okay. That's that being said, we don't make them specifically for that. Yeah, yet. I wouldn't that's, hold you. That's to more it, of a Michelle question. Yeah, that's a right. Michelle question. I honestly right, she would more about that than I would. Yeah. I'll try it out at some point for sure. Uh, yeah. So if you guys want to go, it's uh, Salt Cat Soap. It's over there on Twitter. It's also on Instagram, and they have an Etsy shop, so you can yeah, go check go to, those out. I'm sure. Go to Etsy, Salt Cat Soap, all one word. It should be pretty easy to find. There you so, go. Uh, anyway, thank oh, you for giving me a moment. Of course, of yeah. course. Please, you're here. We're yeah. here to hang out, man. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just to let you all know, ladies and gentlemen, the Streamlabs and the super chats are open send in some support already got some super chats rolling in quickly as possible We've, i asked bibs to come up with some stories maybe set some goals here and so let me read them out for some of you who are watching so now we've got about 75 of you watching please hit that like button as well but he's got uh, top three pranks my parents pulled on me there's a first tier maybe at the maybe at the hundred dollar mark we'll do my other brother i don't know what that means uh, these are all teases. Yeah, these are all, te all right, the second tier, maybe the two hundred dollar mark. We'll do the gardenia incident, the gardenia incident, uh, uh, which sounds like an episode from Columbo. And the third <laughs> tier at the three hundred mark, we, we could do my first and worst dog. So for you dog lovers out there, maybe you're motivated to send him to get us <laughs> to that tier, so we I can hear you, that stuff. I, I assure you, I will tell you right now that title. There, there are no bad dogs. Right, but true. this might be this. There, there is a there's a reason that the story is called that. So, <laughs> okay. um, my parents used me uh, as I me. Mean, my they were parents. They raised me. They were very good to me. They took care of me. But they also used me as the straight man in a lot of comedy bits that I did not sign up for. <laughs> uh, and it'll explain a lot about me, I think, if you hear some of these stories. So I love it. Uh, that's that's what I came up with. I, I was literally right. you told me like come up with some stories, and now I'm on the spot. It's like I you like tell it. someone like. Hey, tell me a joke. And I'm like, ah, I can't remember any jokes anymore. Uh, so I had to call my mom. And I was like, Mom, do I have any stories? And she told me these incredibly embarrassing tales. And they all came flooding back. And now I can oh, share Oh, wow. Okay, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a story at $100 mark, story at $200 mark, story at $300 mark. And if we get to the $400 mark, uh, he can talk about the only I love you that mattered and how I got distracted and missed it, how Bibbs got distracted and missed it. So that could be interesting if we get to the $400 mark as we go along. So send in your stream labs is right above Bibs is head. The address is also in the chat or in the, uh, in the description. And I'm going to pin it to the chat in just a second. After I answer, ask some of these questions of Bibs. And as he's talking, I'll do that. So look for it in there. I'm about to pin it. Roberto Arsenal says when it comes to Bibs, I'm with Harlow. I love a lot of movies. Bibs doesn't like and vice versa, but I appreciate his opinion and his love and and love his love for movies. That's true, man. You you go out there and you stump for some of these films that most people turn away from and don't like, but you have a sensibility for them. And I'll be damned if you can't defend your point of view. Did you develop this as you were growing up, figuring out, hey, wait a minute, how come I like these movies other people don't seem to like? Well, I, I think it, I grew up with a lot of scorn for a lot of types of movies that nowadays we people openly like. Yeah, um, fair. A lot of film critics were, when I was growing up, were really just, just absolutely just crapping on like the Friday the 13th franchise or movies based on superheroes. Yes. And these things were denigrated really, really publicly. And it made me realize that 
I grew up respecting film critics, and a lot of the movies that I have come to appreciate and a lot of the things that I've come to appreciate about movies has come from listening to film critics. But I've also learned yeah. that film critics are very fallible. They're human. There is no such thing as objective criticism. It's all subjective. And yep. I realized that I want to do this. I want to be a part of the conversation, but I really want to be open-minded. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just dismiss something out of hand. I never want to be the kind of person who says this whole genre is bunk. I want right. to make sure that I give everything a fair shake. And... As a result, I try to when I'm watching a movie and I and I'm noticing that it's not working for me. Yeah. My first question is is it my fault? Am mm-hmm. I approaching this from the wrong angle? Like okay, so like I'm watching this movie and it's not really what I expected. Okay, is the right. problem my expectation? Maybe the trailer set me up for something that the movie wasn't going to give and mm. I think this mentality, I'm not saying this makes me better or anything like that, but I think this mentality makes me a little bit more open to appreciate movies that a lot of other people are going off of their first reaction to. And what I find (laughs) often, not unilaterally yet, but often movies that I go, this, I I enjoy this. Maybe it's not amazing, but I find it perfectly entertaining. They're frequently films that people like come around later and say, you know, this was good actually. And I'm like, yeah, I, I told you (laughs) that's what I've been saying for like 10 years and nobody cared. Like, I don't know what happened. And what I realized is that that initial narrative around a movie uh, is really influential, even if it's just subconscious. And after that narrative goes away and it's not about the anticipation, it's not about expectation. It's not about the assumption that it will be bad because word of mouth is bad after it's just been around. And it's not about whether it meets our expectations or not. It just is. Yeah, and we accept yeah. the movie for what it is, good or bad. We're a little more lenient about it. Yeah, and for me, I feel like if we could approach every movie with that kind of open mindedness, a lot of movies still stink. And I can be a really harsh critic sometime. Anyone who listens mm. to my podcast will tell you. But um, I, I genuinely believe that we can skip that decade where we don't like a movie and mm. skip right to the part where we do like imagine if right away everyone just said you know what movie's pretty good hocus pocus and then uh-huh. it wouldn't be like 20 years later everyone's like hey this movie's actually a classic and i'm like yeah we could have been saying that for 20 years but some of you just weren't into it yet like i just let's just right. enjoy it now um so i believe that it is a film critic's job to be honest and to explain their opinion. That's the single most important right. thing a critic has to do. So we, we all have our opinion. Our opinion may be subjective, but the explanation needs to be quantitative. We need yeah. to be able to say, I like this because of these reasons. And in fact, at the end of the explanation, you don't necessarily have to agree, but the, I go, the goal is that the reader or the listener can say, okay, I see why they like that. And maybe yeah. the next time I look at it, I will see those things. I will focus on that angle and maybe I can appreciate it too. And then yay, I get another movie I like. Yeah. So well, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that I think that should be the goal. I mean, again, not everything is good. Sometimes right. movies age poorly. Sometimes movies are just bad. But yeah, I think I think we should but, be looking at things hoping that they're good. Yeah, that's for sure. But don't don't you think though that like Things have to like the people who love these movies are kids at the time or young people at the time. And so they have to grow into their power as a fan base and they become the loudest voices in the room about a movie that yeah. they enjoyed that the critics kind of best. Like, I think that's the deal with the yeah. prequels, the prequel trilogy, pretty much across the board, 80%, 90% of the original trilogy people did not like the, 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 uh, the, the original, the prequel trilogy, but then mm-hmm. those kids who grew up with that star Wars, got older and they became the voices in the room. They yep. became the fans. They became the critics uh, and the two YouTube people. And they've changed the narrative about the overall acceptance of the prequel trilogy. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm going to say this right now. The, the yeah. whole thing, Star Wars is a tricky example for this because Star Wars okay. is one of the most viewed movie series on the planet. True. So keeping track of everyone's opinion of it is actually really difficult. It might seem like there's a wave of appreciation or a wave of criticism, but everyone's sort of microcosm is very, very different. I remember when the tre- the prequels were coming out and yep. from when I my experience watching them was there was an initial wave of overwhelming enthusiasm where oh, they were yeah. new and they were exciting and you know Roger Ebert gave uh, uh Phantom Menace four stars and it was it was considered very very positive 
across the board. And then over time, after the enthusiasm waned a bit, we started looking at him like, actually, the narrative isn't constructed very well. And it's got yeah. all of these issues that are kind of frustrating. And then the next one came out. I'm like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And Yoda fought with a lightsaber. And then that died down a little bit. And I'm like, well, actually, the love story was really clunky. And some of the yeah. dialogue was bad. And did you notice that Anakin Skywalker killed a whole bunch of children? And <laughs> we're all supposed to still like him. And now he has an animated series. What's up with that? And then yeah. the third one came out. And it was better. And everyone's like, oh, this is amazing. And, and then those kids who grew up with these things, you know, yeah, they do change the narrative. I, yep. My generation helped change the narrative around superhero movies, yes. video games as an art form. That's totally a part of it. But yeah. I do think it's fair to say that the, the people aren't this big monolith and everyone likes something and everyone doesn't like something. When yeah. I was when I was uh, uh, watching the prequels coming out, I was about – I think it was 18 when the Phantom Menace came out okay. and I was, I knew people who had little kids. I knew like neighbors who had little mm -hmm. kids and so on. And every single parent that I was talking to, every single little kid that was uh, uh, in my community, yeah. they were bored to tears by it. Yes. They did not like it. Right. So I do think that it's, it's highly situational. And I think it's really important that we not look at these things as monolithic. I think it's important that, However, back to my previous point, I think it's important that critics try not to be monolithic too. Yes, um, there, there is that sometimes. Sometimes people get like a, this huge wave of um, of enthusiasm, and sometimes the enthusiasm becomes so big that it sets up this unrealistic expectation about the movie, right. and then the movie actually right. comes out, and people are like, "That's like three stars," and like, fine, but. Again, it's an issue of anticipation, and sometimes people get a little harsh about things, and I know yeah. I've fallen into that trap, and I've tried to fall out of it, uh, and all of these things are perfectly fair, but it, mostly what we all have to do, I think, is we all have to pull back a bit and yeah. just be reasonable about it. I think there's a lot to like in mm -hmm. the Star Wars prequels. I also think mostly they stink. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they work very well as films. There are bits that I like in them, but sure. I don't think they're told very well as a narrative. I think they really lost a lot of the humanity. There's that moment I remember, it's like last year or something, when um, mm -hmm. there was like a behind the scenes feature on the Mandalorian on Disney Plus, and it oh, was right. Dave, and it was Dave Filoni explaining yeah. like, here's the arc of the Qui -Gon original. Jin. Of, yeah. yeah, here's the arc of the prequel trilogy, and here's why Qui Gon Jinn was so important. And a lot of people were on on line and they were saying like see this is why they're great and i was like actually no i think this is maybe the harshest criticism i've ever heard of the prequels because <laughs> if the prequels told that story effectively in an emotional grounded level we wouldn't need dave filoni to explain this to us 20 years later mm. Good so point. i th i just think i think he lost yeah. that deeply personal connection with it and it became something a little bit more abstract ironically i think it became something a lot closer to the Flash Gordon serials mm. uh, on which these things were based. If you look at the Phantom Menace, I think in particular, it's incredibly episodic. Yeah. It goes from like 10 minute chunk to 10 minute chunk. And yes. on that level, I think it's actually kind of interesting, but I don't think it works very well as a through line. So okay. I think fair. a lot of the criticisms are fair, but I think a lot of the enthusiasm is fair too. And the important thing is that we're all talking about it and being reasonable. At least that's yeah. the goal, I think. And it's being reborn again. Yeah. <laughs> Vincent Zawanda says, Hey, John and Bibbs, big fan of you both. Bibbs, what movies would you want to do? Oh. On the cinephile. I mean, I would love it. I would love it. Films on the cinephile. Oh yes. my god, that's that's a change of tune. I remember once you told me you never would. No, um, well, you know, a, no, we were we were we were being touchy at the time. We we progressed. Um, yes, go ahead. Did. Yes, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. I actually I haven't listened to every single episode, so I don't want to like pick something you've done. Um, oh, okay. I'm trying to think. Is there like a limit? Like how recently it has to be? Like yeah, ten no. years. We ten try years. to keep it. Ten years any, Nothing, with, nothing okay. within the last ten years. So we try that's, to keep it. Uh, just, that's why. That wise. we have time to appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. No, that's really, really smart. Um, I would love to do some classic horror. Um, I don't know if you've Ooh, done maybe. We haven't I've, done. We've never done, done Frankenstein, Wolfman, okay. Dracula, uh, House of Wax, uh, The Raven. Oh. We've never done any of those. So. I would love to. Do, oh, we could do. We could do both of the House of Waxes, the original 1930s one by Michael Curtiz, yeah, and then the Vincent Price one. They're a good double feature. Uh, okay. Maybe uh, Robert Wise's The Haunting. Uh, like I would love to do some old classic horror. That would be really cool. You know, nobody. I like that. I'll write that down. I'll put it yeah. down. Absolutely. I'll tell Steve. I mean. You know, it's incredible. You mentioned Robert Wise. I was doing my trailer reaction for the West Side Story, and I was, and I went yeah. into Robert Wise because like, I was like, this guy. No one talks about him with the same reverence that they talk about other directors, and yet this guy 
quietly was successful in multiple genres he was and has examples of multiple genres where he's a success and worked with Wells on Kane, for God's sake. Well, he worked with Wells on Kane and he worked with Wells on the Magnificent Ambersons. And yes. then when Wells left the country and the studio decided to reshoot the ending, yeah. they went to Robert Wise. And that was actually his first directing gig because they wanted it to match what Wells had done. And Robert Wise, who edited the film, knew all about that. And uh, that led to this rift, and they didn't. Yeah, I don't think they yeah. talked together for many, many years. Um, Wise is an incredible filmmaker. He worked in a lot of different genres, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, it's one of those frustrating things where I feel like there was probably a time. It's before my time, like in the '60s and '70s, when Wise probably was a brand name director. He'd done yeah. the Day the Earth Stood Still, The Sound of Music, West Side Story, The Haunting, Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and nice. then a lot of those movies just started to gradually become old yeah yeah if Good they point. don't stay part of everyone's sort of regular media diet that's when they become old that's why like i feel mm. we're in this interesting age where like you and i we grew up when they were starting to like finally have like home video and it was starting yeah. to be the kind of thing people can rent movies pretty regularly and now mm. we if we wanted to see an old movie uh we weren't at the mercy of oh we maybe we'd be lucky and catch it on television or maybe there'd be a revival screening we yeah. actually had some control over that and then we started getting cable and started getting more movies and then we started getting dvds and streaming services and now i feel like the last 30 maybe 40 years of cinema mm -hmm. we don't look at in the same sort of historical context like when i was a kid the godfather was considered an old movie <laughs> the godfather was wow. only wow. as old when i was thinking this was an old movie right when it's only as old as the phantom menace is now but we still talk about the phantom menace it's still part of right. our regular diet and as a result we don't think of it as this old thing that came out a long time ago it's old <laughs> star wars right now star yeah. wars the original star yeah. wars is older or at least as old as the original flash gordon 1930s serials were when star wars came out oh good point yeah 40 yeah. years yeah 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 which is That's why I, great point. Which, yeah. which is why i think some of my attitudes about star wars are a little different than some people because for me everyone's like i, I feel like what Star Wars did was it took this old thing and it made mm -hmm. it new. And I feel like if we're not trying to make Star Wars feel new, if we're yeah. not trying to sort of adapt the types of stories that we're fitting into Star Wars, if it's only trying to evoke the exact same stuff George Lucas did, Flash Gordon, Samurai movies, etc., then right. it's we're just keeping it in the past and we're just keeping it feeling really retro. It's one of the reasons why I liked some of the stuff that like was in The Last Jedi, for example, mm. where – they were trying to actually push it forward and trying to maybe evoke the things that were more contemporaneous with Star Wars, but totally yeah. fit the mold. And there's this interesting push and pull there where some people wanted to be able to move forward so that it kind of continues to have that extemporaneous, we're making the old feel new again. And some yeah. people just want it to feel old, which is ironic because originally it felt new. I yeah. Get it. yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Great point, actually. Bibbs. Uh, Chris Taylor says, Bibbs, I need to see you have a danger diabolic uh, entrance for a studio match or live event for the show. Uh, yeah. That would be the coolest. Have you seen Danger Diabolic? No, I don't know what it is. What oh, is my it? God. Okay, so Danger Diabolic is this comic book movie from the 1960s directed by Mario Ooh. Bava, who directed some of the greatest and most influential horror movies of all time. But he's another guy who works in every genre. Okay. And uh, Diabolic is, uh, I think it's an Italian, but it's a European comic book that's okay. actually all about a supervillain. That's his whole thing. It's like it's like if we skipped over Batman and we gave the Joker his own comic. And that right. was a very successful comic. And he was a master thief and he was incredibly sexy and he like was this agent of chaos who would like take down the man and like ruin capitalist enterprises. And he was just this okay. amazing anti-hero. And Mario Bava made this incredibly slick sexy, groovy, the music's a fantastic uh, movie in the 1960s. It's one of my favorite comic book adaptations, and it doesn't get talked about enough. Um, but, uh, and it's, it's very 60s, but, it, you know, it fits the style of the, the film and the tone. Right. Um, and uh, it's got, like, one of the great theme songs. It's really sexy. Deep, deep down. Like, very loungy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, for some reason, it's considered more of a cult thing here than anything else. Okay. Um, I would love to do a Danger Diabolic entrance. The, I would love to be able to use the score. Uh, but is that, it? How, is that it right there? Is that it right there? Where you go? Yeah, that's it. 
That's Danger wow. Diabolical. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. with, uh, I think it's uh, John Philip Law, who you may remember as the angel from Barbarella. Um, oh, yes. yes yeah. Um, anyway, great movie. Please go see Danger Diabolic if you haven't. It's so, so sexy and fun. Uh, but, uh, okay. Yeah, exa- but that's kind of one of the reasons why it would be tricky to do is, as a Schmodown entrance. You know, with the Schmodown entrance, you only get a short amount of time. And yeah. I've pushed that before. And Christian's always just like, scale it way the hell back. You get 20 <laughs> seconds. Just move along. So it's got a read quickly that's what yeah. it's got to do and the problem when you do something kind of obscure is if it's obscure it won't read quickly it won't might not read at all so it needs right. to read as interesting even if you don't get it unless it's like really obvious like if i'm doing like a predator entrance or an alien entrance right so also the other trick is that we can't use like mu- music from movies anymore the way we used right. to we're so, not allowed to w- do that yeah which is fine but it robs us of that sense of immediacy like if you heard the terminator score you yeah. know i was doing a terminator entrance and now i don't have that tool in the toolbox and it just makes it trickier that's a um, fair point yeah, but it's anyway, like, David, that success. There we go. That's yeah. it. Who would you recruit? Would you recruit? Would, would you bring back Miss Movies to play this? Would Stacy play? <laughs> Who would you recruit to play the well, character you come in with? I mean, at the time, it would have definitely picked Whitney because um, Whitney oh. would have totally been up for it. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Actually, I hadn't really. Th- I hadn't thought out that element of it. I imagine what yeah. I would probably do is this great bit where Diabolic is scaling like a, a big tower to rescue his girlfriend who's been kidnapped by Mario Adorf, who was. Um, Oh, what movie was he a Bond villain in? Was it Thunderball that Mario Adorf was in? Sure, if you say so. Okay. I'm still studying the Bonds. Yeah. I, I want to say it was Thunderball, but it was around that era. Okay. And um, he's kidnapped his wife, and so he's got to save him. And, and this is actually, they did a whole Beastie Boys video that was an homage to Danger Diabolic. So I probably do something that evokes that, because that might be more recognizable. Okay. All yeah. right. I like that idea. <laughs> this yeah. is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I love this idea. All right. Let's see. We've got some uh, Streamlabs that have come through. And ladies and gentlemen, cool. we've got Streamlabs Super Chats. Send them in right now. We got. So, we only got a little bit about a time with Pibs. He's got tears, ladies and gentlemen. If we get to $100, he's going to tell us a really interesting story. $200, another story here. I want to make sure I read them so I don't get it wrong. And $100 tier, uh, you get uh, uh, my first and – oh, sorry, and my other brother. A story about my, quote, other brother uh a second tier the two dollar uh hit if we hit it the gardenia incident i love this and a third tier three dollars my first and worst dog and if we get to 400 he's got a crazy story about the only i love you that mattered to him and how he got distracted and missed it so a lot of teasing stories from bibiani if you guys can send in uh some support here and get us to those goals and these are mostly embarrassing stories so you will be this is me spilling tea on myself i love it i love it all right haskell 420 says we need the ultimate crossover patreon event my idea top 10 critically acclaimed with john and matt going on critically acclaimed to talk about their top 10 then the top 10 shows critically acclaimed top 10 and bibs and whitney going on to talk about theirs absolutely we gotta make sure. that happen yeah that'd be yeah, fun I'm, I'm be a with very that. long podcast i know it would be long. at least six hours we, we only sure. do like one top 10 a month we call it the iron list and it's selected by our patrons the topic Ooh. and those usually run between two to two and a half hours like we wow. really go we really go deep so yeah i love it yeah. okay uh so so haskell we might make that happen for sure rad dad talks oh thank you rad dad appreciate it. he said not able to watch live but want to show some support i don't always agree but i sure do respect and enjoy hearing both of your opinions excited to watch this when i can respect oh thank, thank you, you. appreciate that yeah. uh arturo zamorano says did you and bibiani meet through the schmodown and what is one of the most memorable matches for you each yeah mm-hmm. we met through the schmodown for yeah. sure yeah uh, definitely yeah. I remember, um, actually, I think the first match I ever went to, like physically in person, mm. was the first match where you used a blindfold. Oh, really? Against I, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that was the best one. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, this is fun. I'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, because I, I, I love I love showmanship, I love being able, yeah. I love being theatrical. In case you hadn't noticed, uh, <laughs> so yeah, you were you were really a uh, big part of making me want to join up because you wow. asked me to do movie trivia. Cool. You asked me to do movie trivia and be theatrical. Uh, you have my heart and soul forever, and <laughs> I will dedicate my whole life to this enterprise. Do you have what's your most memorable match overall? What was your, I mean? It's, it? it's it's free for all three. I yeah. I was there Dude. the whole time. It was a whole thing, and I, it was a real treat. And I I loved every second of it. Um, yeah. except, except maybe the last question, but um, but uh, beyond that, I'm trying to think what my most memorable like my most memorable match was. I'm trying to think of the one like I go back to. 
Was it like winning the title with with the kid? Was it winning the oh, title that was against great. Draco? Or what it was wasn't. It, it wasn't. That, you know what? My most memorable actually was winning the title against Draco, but it was because of the entrance. Um, ah, yeah. I've, I've done. You know, as people mentioned, I've done a lot of entrances, and that's had to take a backseat in the digital era just because the format doesn't really work. And, you're right. You're right. Um, but uh, we got to in my Mark and Draco title match. Uh, I got to recreate like an episode of MST3K, and we wrote new jokes for it. Uh, but we got to do an MST3K entrance, and I've always wanted to be on MST3K. It's this little kid dream I've had, right? And uh, so I got to do that. So for me, that's like the happiest I think I've ever been was wow. getting to work with everybody. You know, figuring out how to make this work on like the Schmodown budget with a Schmodown green screen, how to right. time out the jokes, how to write the jokes, and that was probably the happiest I've I've ever been. So okay. Yeah. Well, did, didn't Malton introduce you in a match one time? That was, was that a good cool? one, too, actually. Right? I, I was bummed when that wasn't nominated for best. Uh, uh, yeah, that best makes entrance. no sense. That but was, was a really, great entrance. There's, there's a recency bias in everything. The Schmodown, mm. I think, is no exception. And it was right True. at the beginning of the year. Um, yeah. But that one was fun where uh, we were going up against the Shire Wolves. Exactly. And we wanted to do a big entrance. And we thought, what, what if we do a Gremlins entrance? And we were like, well, how do we do a gremlins entrance and so we got like a couple of gremlin dolls and we thought okay well these gremlin dolls will be attacking us and then we realized that kind of sucks and people are going to give us bad reviews wait a minute we know leonard malton leonard malton <laughs> was in gremlins too talking about how gremlins sucked so let's have him give us a bad review and you yeah. know obviously you, you know it's not like we're best buddies it was kind of like we felt a little bit like dennis the menace like hey mr malton like <laughs> but he's a very very kind man and he, he, he is. invited us over and he, he cranked it out and like I think we did like two, maybe three takes. Was, he was in and out in like 20 minutes. And, wow. Uh, but he was a super nice guy. And I love that entrance. I love how that turned out. And yeah. that was a, that was a good memory too. Absolutely. I, yeah. I'm not one for the big entrances, you know, just kind of, I don't have that kind of instinct and I respect the ones who do because it's you like had, massive. Yeah. I feel, I feel like I'm imposing. So I become like real self-conscious about that kind of yeah. shit. So that's on me, but I, I love the great ones. Man. I think you had one of the most dramatic entrances anyone's ever had in the Schmodown at, um, uh, the last live spectacular that oh. we did because you were you were yeah. really sick. You were yes, like, in retrospect, I'm sort of suspicious. Like, did he start the plague? And so, <laughs> uh, because it was Christmas time and you were really sick, and we were going to play was, the Founding man. Fathers, and there was a lot of like on the day we weren't sure if the match was going to happen. Yeah, Christian called me. He said yeah. he called me the night before. He's like. Tell me how you feel in the morning. It, yeah. it, it'll it suck to cancel it, but dude, I'm not going to make you do it if you can't do it. Yeah. But I also know that like, I know that if you, if you can do it, I will do everything possible to make sure you get there. You just have to show up and do the match and leave afterwards. Uh, your girlfriend can take care of, make sure, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it was right. all, I just happened to have a little bit more energy that morning. Cause I'm telling yeah. you that Friday and uh, that Thursday and Friday, I was a, in yeah. fucking pieces, man. In I heard. Pieces. I heard you were really in a bad place. And so it obviously we not good. We did not expect that you were going to play. We, we thought maybe you might because we know how much it means to you. And maybe right. you were going to get lucky and feel better. Uh, I didn't find out we were playing the match until like maybe 10 minutes before Curtain Rose on Spectacular. Oh. I think everyone else knew and someone forgot to tell me. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm like, I didn't even know if I should be ready for this or not. And then uh. and I, was just, and I asked him, I was like, hey, is, is Roka going to be here? And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, well, maybe you should tell me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that was a that was a rough night for me. But um, uh, yeah, uh, but, yeah. well deserved victory on your guys' part. Like, well, absolutely. dude, but, yeah, I was worried. I was worried yeah. as soon as we started. I was like, oh god, have I made a terrible fucking mistake? <laughs> like, what if I forget everything? What if yeah. I can't think because of all the the distraction inside my body? And then we just got we just got lucky, like you said. Yeah. Like I love the way you broke down Ben when you played him in that match. You're like, you can do all the histrionics you want, pal. It's about whether you know the answers or not. And I love yeah. the way you did that. And I was just, and I was, I was thinking the whole night. I was like, well, I either know the answers or I don't. That's the way it goes. Exactly. And that's the game. That's always the game. You can study your asses that's, off. But you never know. That's, that's that's the fundamentals. And you can talk about it like it's a sport and there's strategy. But if you don't know how to dribble the ball, you're not going to win a basketball game. Yes. So that's what it boils down to is it's when it, you, you, once you strip all that away, if you get to the point where people don't get in your head and stuff and yeah. you can like stay concentrating and just be present for the match, it's just you and the questions. Yep. yep. That's all questions. it is. It's just you and the questions. And when you can strip it all away and you, you do your best to put smart choices on the wheel. And if you get spinners or opponents choice, you do your best to pick a good category. But yep. other than that, there's not a lot of strategy. It's just get the questions right. 
Yep, exactly. And sometimes uh, can- the questions are just about stuff you don't know. It sucks. Yeah, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you can not- stu- like I said, it's, you can study your ass off, and there's that one movie you didn't even think about, and yeah. boom, you know, you're screwed. Uh, Carol donated. She said, I just want to tell Bibbs that as a cat person, I loved all the Catch Down promo videos the Mercs put out last year. Yay. All- also, please help me convince John to watch the Never Ending Story 1 and 2. They are on HBO Max. Just bring oh. tissues for the first one. Yeah, I've never seen the Never oh. Ending Story okay. uh, or Labyrinth. I've just resisted oh. those because I think they, I think I was like, you know, I was at that age where I was like, I'm not watching those kids' films and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But oh, I've never that's... gone back to watch it. So. Well, I'm, I think that's interesting that you're revealing these like, fantasy movie weaknesses and like one of the <laughs> Jim Henson films. So now everyone's like writing this down. Like, eh. yeah, feel um, free, feel free yeah. to do it. People. <laughs> uh, I, I will. First off, I am also a cat person and I always wanted to do stuff with my cats at the Schmodown, but cats aren't dogs. You can't like bring them to a public place. It's not safe mm-hmm. for them. They'll get, in, they'll get anxiety. They might run away. And it was never something I seriously considered for one second, but yeah. I always was a little jealous of people who got to bring in their dogs. And I was like, Oh, I have great cats. So when we started doing them from home, I was like, well, at least I get to include my cats in the videos. And yeah. So that was fun. And um, it's nice because uh, one of the cats, that I did our videos with uh, Sergio is sadly no longer with us. And oh, so I'm I, sorry, have, I, I know it was really rough. It was right over the Christmas uh, season too, and um, and uh, he. Uh, it's nice to have this memento of him, like, and people like were able to be amused by him and see how sweet and wonderful he was. So that's really great. Right. That is um, great. But uh, Never Ending Story one and two. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going to say this right now. You need to see Never Ending Story one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Never ending story. Two. Here's the weird thing: Never ending story one and two. I believe, yeah. based on my knowledge, I haven't actually read the book, but it's my understanding that they're both adaptations of the book. Like the first movie only covered like the first half, yeah, of the story, and then they went on to Never Ending Story two. Whatever you do, don't see Never Ending Story three. It is a piece of crap. It oh is God. so was bad. One? Really, Jeez, yeah, I think it might even be a fourth. I'm, 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 my, my memory might be defeating me there. Um, but the first one is this interesting, like really surprisingly, like dour and thoughtful okay. fantasy movie like it's in by wolfgang peterson and he doesn't really have like a lot of like flights of fancy Dude, in him wolfgang um, peterson yeah. mind-blowing that he did that film but anyway yeah yeah, yeah he's and it's and it, and it plays a lot like it like it's taken really seriously and sometimes i think Ooh. to the film's detriment but i do think it has like a very different very powerful vibe and i think if you watch it, you're gonna realize this was this was for kids <laughs> like there's a, there's okay. a scene in this movie where like a horse gets so sad it decides not to live anymore and wow. i'm like what the ouch like they were just no one cared what kids saw in the 80s okay um, but yeah, uh, never true. story never story 2 has some fun bits in it but i don't think it works as well as the film but if you like the first one i guess you might as well but you don't need to go and pass that and okay. definitely see labyrinth labyrinth kicks ass all right, all right, yeah. and I'll watch. Them. I'll definitely watch it now that yeah. you explained it that way. I'll watch them this weekend, so you can't use them. By the way, I'm at 85 percent on fantasy sci-fi with my yeah. patrons. So, so you kiss my ass. You try to put that on the wheel. Anybody who's watching, <laughs> not you. Anybody who's watching, uh, Vincent Zawada said, "I saw rumors that the actual cut of Amadeus will get a 4K remaster." Yes. Bibbs, what do you think of the director's cut and the movie overall? Amadeus was the first movie I saw in a theater. Um, yeah. I'm going to well, chime in on this one, too, so go ahead. No, I, well, technically, technically, the first movie I saw in a the theater, I apparently was so young I don't remember it, and it was actually the uh, Saturday Night Fever sequel, Staying Alive. I love that movie. I will defend I, that movie to my dying day, Bibbs. So will I. I, I actually like that. I think the original was better, but yes. I, I actually really like that movie um, as sort of this weird stealth biopic of Stallone. Um, but oh, no, I like I like no, it works actually. You look at him as just as a struggling actor, and just That's instead great. it's about dance. But like, yeah, no, I like that movie a lot. Actually, I think the movie gets a bum rap. Um, but yeah, um, I, I interviewed Frank Stallone on uh, my channel a month ago or so, and I spent half an hour on staying alive. I much to his chagrin, probably. But anyway, sorry, but go ahead. But the first movie I remember seeing in a the theater, and I couldn't have been more than two or three, was yeah. Amadeus, and I freaking loved it and in fact i loved yeah. it so much that when it was over i asked my mom i like tugged on her dress i was like can we see it again and we just went right back in wow uh, it's an incredible motion picture it's That's one of my great. very very favorites the director's cut is an interesting beast because on one hand it actually does fix something that i think is a problem with the film and that uh there's this relationship between uh constanza mozart and salieri yeah, yeah. Uh, that in it shouldn't the, be in, there and well in the theatrical cut 
she doesn't like Salieri, but there's no particular reason for her to do so. Yeah. And then you see the director's cut, and they included this scene where Salieri basically humiliates her. And so yeah. it justifies her hatred of Salieri. But then it also adds this, all this extra stuff of, like, Mozart trying to be a music teacher and stuff. And, I'm like, it's all interesting, and I can see why you shot it. But I actually think it kills the pacing in the movie. I agree. Yeah. So I actually prefer, even though there's definitely, like, a scene that, like, definitely helps the story make a little bit more sense i actually prefer the theatrical cut but yeah. they're both really good cuts they're it's an excellent movie either way and it's still one of my very favorites it's my father's favorite movie and uh-huh. you know as, as the son of immigrants my dad an immigrant i had no idea he would like a movie about classical music because yeah. my dad was like you know blue collar worker worked the fields in bolivia and so yeah. and when we came up and when this film he loved quoting this movie all day all night till the till the, till he passed this was his favorite movie, and so it has a special place, Mark, because I love it, too, as much as you you say you love it. And and I would love to see a 4K of this, because it's a gorgeous movie. So, it's so damn pretty. And, to see it and cleaned I, up would be great. Yeah. And it's one of those movies, and I think you bring up an interesting point. It's like it's about classical music, and you can kind of just see people's eyes glaze yeah. over yeah, 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 once yeah. you mention that. But Milos Forman was really clever, and without going as all out as someone like, say, Baz Luhrmann would do in Moulin Rouge, he understood that he needed to draw a thin – no, sorry, you draw a very clear line yeah. between classical music and contemporary music to show that at the time, what Mozart was doing was punk rock. Yeah. And he was really just absolutely like changing the whole paradigm and like blowing people away and doing completely different things. And the movie is so clear about illustrating that, not just through the dialogue, but through the costume design. Uh, Mozart's pink wig is not like, <laughs> it's not just there for funsies, it's there because punks were dyeing their hair in the 80s. Right. Um, so I think it's even if you know nothing about classical music, Mozart is reads very, very clear. Mm-hmm. More yeah. so than something like I don't know, Mortal Beloved does, which is a little bit more strange, oh, you know. It's a yeah, Mortal Beloved is a failure. A, a, mm. But there are beautiful scenes. I mean, the Oda yeah. Joy sequence alone yeah, is good stuff. incredible. Right. Yeah, but overall. Yeah. Uh let's get back to some more of these uh here real quick. Aaron Clister says, Bibbs, I may not always root for you during the matches, but damn, I always tune in with a smile on my face when you play because I know I'm in for a great match. You are amazing, sir. Uh, part two coming soon for my question. So here it is. So, Bibbs, is there a horror movie you love slash adore that majority of the people don't think twice on or vice versa? I ask because I hear your arguments on your opinions about certain movies are legendary. That is true. Wow. Well, thank you. I will um, echo that. Very I, well. Kind of, kind of you to say. I, I, I don't take compliments well, and so when when you mention like I like watching you play, but I don't always root for you. Part of me is just like, yeah, me either. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a lot of horror movies that I that I love that a lot of other people don't talk about. Uh, one uh-huh. one that um, I'm deeply in love with this movie, and it's a remake, and it's a remake that nobody talks about. Uh, it is the Claude Rains version of the Phantom of the Opera. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, okay. the, Lon, the Lon Chaney one, the silent movie is a classic. Don't yes. get me wrong. I haven't seen the Robert England one in a long, long time, so I don't remember it very well. But uh, the 1940s universal uh, Phantom of the Opera, starring Claude Rains as the Phantom of the Opera, yeah. is absolutely wonderful, and nobody talks about it, and I do not know why. I think it's just because the silent movie is so iconic. The imagery is so indelible. But right. – what they did with this Phantom of the Opera is they treated it more like an adventure story. Mm-hmm. And so the fan and, and indeed the Phantom of the Opera is a very sympathetic villain in this one, in that it almost plays like um, one of the classic Batman the animated series stories where mm-hmm. it's about the origin of the villain, and you see like how they started off kind of sympathetically, or at the very least you could understand their plight. So the Phantom of the Opera starts off as this, you know, uh, uh, violinist who uh, is secretly funding the career of this young girl who is an understudy at the opera. Mm. And he has written uh, a concerto or an opera uh, that he thinks is going to finally be his big break. And he's finally going to be able to afford all these things. And um, he mistakes, uh, he makes a mistake and he thinks they're stealing his opera. Like they're going to just, they're just going to copy it and not give him any credit. And so he completely flips out and you totally see why he's having this nervous breakdown. He's just been fired. This young girl who's probably his daughter and she doesn't know it, uh, is never going to understand or appreciate him because also he just completely flips out. And then all of these like printing chemicals gets shoved on his face and he gets disfigured. And, and then the rest well, of the movie is he, you're really on his side. Like you're totally with him. Wow. He's overreacting, but he's really on his side for it. It's gorgeous, Technicolor, really, really pretty. And then okay. the rest of the movie is 
the 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 young uh, ingenue and the two men who love her in this very very flirtatious love triangle and i mean flirtatious between all three of them uh -huh. and uh, it's all about them fighting for her and like having sword fights to protect her, and it's just oh. great. It's a great, you know, kind of. It's not really a horror movie by a lot of modern conventions, but at the time, it definitely was, and it's really wonderful. And it's my favorite version of that film. So wow. uh, nobody talks about. it. I think it's really great. Uh, what, is it called? Uh, yeah, it's it really? the opera. Yeah, from 19, I, I forget the year. I want to say it's like 1942, 43, okay. maybe. Uh, but it's 1940s. Oh, yeah. It's the only one with Claude Rains. So you can't yeah. miss it. And it uh, yeah, just yeah. really good. Oh, shit. Nelson Eddy's in this thing. My mom loved yeah. Nelson Eddy. Hey, I'll go. be damned. Okay. All right. Interesting. All right. Uh, let's get some, some more of these real quick here. Pepper Dog Dirt says, Bibbs, you briefly mentioned how our generation has advocated for video games as an art form. This is something I'm passionate about. What games do you all think capture that idea? God of War 2018, Inside, and the Metal Gear Solid games come to mind. Sure. Um, um, John, I'll, I'll, do you want me to start here? Yeah, um, please. <laughs> Knock your stuff out. I think, I think video games have been an art form for an incredibly long time. It's yes. just they're an art form that's kind of hard to understand. A lot of people assume that because the player has some control in a video game that it cannot be art because the player gets to decide on their experience, but their experience right. is only within very limited parameters. It's like, yeah, here's a nice painting, but we're not showing you the back. Yeah. So you can look at it from any angle. That doesn't change the fact that it's art. So I think there've been a lot of really incredible uh, uh, videos. I think my one of my favorite in terms of like storytelling is actually um, this game Psychonauts, uh, which is all about um, uh, children with psychic powers who uh, jump into the minds of disturbed people in order to cure them of their baggage. Whoa! Uh, it's really, really good. It's not a great platformer. The controls have never been amazing, but as a storytelling, yeah. the the comedy, the the insight, it's really, really fun. It's super inventive. Uh -huh. I think they're finally doing a sequel, which I'm really excited about. Um, but for me, I actually think maybe the ultimate artistic example of video games, and I, 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 I'm not going to take credit for like no, recognizing this. I read a thing about this once, and I was like, "Oh my god, you're right. This is genius." Mm -hmm. um, is Missile Command? Oh, <laughs> nice choice, man. Missile Command is actually yeah. a really early arcade game, and if you're unfamiliar with it, it's uh, you have one screen, and you have three bunkers. One mm -hmm. at left and right, one in the middle, and then uh, someone is shooting nuclear weapons at you. And if any of them hit your bunker, you lose that bunker. And when you lose all three bunkers, the game is over. And yeah. what you're doing is you're trying to shoot anti-air missiles to stop the nuclear weapons. But here's the thing. There's no way to win the game. <laughs> You're just trying to stave off nuclear annihilation as long as you can. The game is about the futility of nuclear war. Right. The game is about the futility of the arms race. The game is about how basically everything else we make games about is this weird exercise in existential futility. And you cannot miss that when you're playing the game. You are desperate to try to save everyone's life, but everyone's dead already. They're, you're just you're trying to stave it off as long as you can. You've right. already, the world is already over. And there's something really pure about that. It's such an incredible thing. Like, if it wasn't a video game, it would be in a museum. Like, it's truly brilliant. That's I awesome. It. I'd say for, for the most recent ones, Ghost of Tsushima, which I've been diving into as a massive Kurosawa fan and Samurai fan, uh, is one that I, I think really the cinematography, the story itself, the Samurai fights, the battles, all of it is just kind of drives me insane at how gorgeous and incredible it is at capturing that. Uh, I thought the Assassin's Creed video games have been phenomenal. Whether that movie was good or not, it's your subjective opinion. But the <laughs> games themselves have, in terms of the storytelling and the world yeah. building, is I love those games. stellar, man. I've fallen, stellar. Off of the, I've fallen off of those games, but I played the first few, and I really, really loved them. I, I, yeah. I was never a huge fan of the framing sequence. I don't know if they ever really got around to making that work better but yeah the actual like Im the actual immersion of it and the incredible use of uh uh mobility is just really really gorgeous and i, lo and I love just how they're actually they actually went on a mission to sort of recontextualize some history like i remember yeah. when they made like a niccolo machiavelli uh a hero right and a lot of people consider niccolo machiavelli like this incredibly wicked person who wrote this incredibly evil book about <laughs> how to be a fascist and people don't realize that was a that was a satire 
Yeah. That was a joke. That was him being sarcastic. It, the, the obvious gag at the time was, if you're evil, you would do this. And, of course, that got lost to history. And I appreciated right. that Assassin's Creed was trying to reframe that a little bit. Um, and it really drives home kind of the point when people say, like, I was being sarcastic. I was being satirical. And I'm like, if what if your satire is indistinguishable from the thing you're satirizing, it won't work. Yeah, that's a you very need, good you point. You need to wink at the camera. You need to make sure people know. I'm not just doing the thing. I am actually commenting on it. And if you yeah. miss that, then people can take away all the wrong things from it and it ends up not helping anybody. So it's an excellent point. Yeah. Uh, Justin Toner says, Hey, John and Bibbs, thank you for coming on the Outlaw Nation, Bibbs. Who are your favorite director or directors when it comes to horror films? Okay. Um, well, a lot of them are the, are the kind of the obvious ones. I think David Cronenberg um, is one of the most insightful horror directors we ever had. Hell yeah. Um, Wes Craven is an interesting, like he's really hit or miss actually, but he never like made a movie without ideas. Everything, mm -hmm. even his misses were always really, really interesting. So a uh, big fan there. Uh, okay. Dario Argento is one of the great stylists we've ever had. Absolutely. Um, he remained prolific long after I think he lost like his like passion for it, but his first like 20 years of film is just absolutely incredible. Um, I think here. Who else? What about oh, recently? Jay what about yeah. Alexander Aja? Do you like him? Robert Eggers? Um, yeah. Any of these more recent ones that, uh, sure. that you have a thing for? Sure. I think uh, I think uh, Jordan Peele uh, is on a oh, tear. Yeah. I think his first two movies are both instant classics. Um, Robert Eggers is, I think, is a really exciting filmmaker. I love him. I think he's one of the great stylists that we have. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander Aja is. He's really blunt, and when he <laughs> leans into that, when he leans into that, and he's just making something kind of pure and simple, yeah, I think yeah. it's great. I think I think his Piranha is really really fun. I loved Crawl. Crawl yes, is a great Crawl's horror great. movie. Uh, yeah. But then when he does something with that has like some actual like depth to it, like The Hills of Eyes, which is based on a really good Wes Craven movie, I was yeah. just like really just really heavy handed, and I just thought he. he but when he says focused, he's 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 one of the best. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, Oh, who's the guy that did um, Hereditary? It's Ari Aster. Yeah, Ari Aster. Um, Ari Aster is an interesting filmmaker in that I think he has yet to make a movie that didn't feel like a riff on another arguably better film, but mm. he still brings a lot to it, and he gives his actors the space they need to make something really powerful. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen if he ever tries to break out of that sort of, I'm going to riff on the wicker man, or I'm going to yeah. riff on, you know, all these other uh, riff on, you know, all these other films about uh, these sort of Roman Polanski type thing he's got going on. So, um, yeah. So th there's a lot of great filmmakers working right now. I'm not, I don't mean to begrudge no, any no. of them. I was just thinking yeah. about like, who are my, who are my go-tos? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, I think John Carpenter, obviously one of the greats. I think Karen Kusama is actually oh, one yes. of the best filmmakers. Between Jennifer's Body and the uh, the Invitation, just mm -hmm. oh, instant master of horror. Um, I'm trying to think, what about Jennifer Kent? Anything there? Oh, first? she's great. Bob, oh my Bob god, and the Babadook. The Babadook yeah. is stunning. The Nightingale. I don't know if I'd qualify that as a horror movie per se, oh. but it's certainly horror adjacent because it's, it's a horror to get through. Oh it's a god. horrifying <laughs> film, but it's it's really brilliant. I, I think it's more of like. It's more of a Western, I think, than anything yeah, else. It's just happened to be in Australia. Um, you know, um, so, yeah, like, I'm actually looking at my wall of horror films right now to see if there's ah. anyone. Uh, I've forgotten. Um, oh, God. not, not uh, Larry Cohen uh, okay. is one of the most creative filmmakers uh, we ever had. It's certainly one of the cleverest genre storytellers. Um, you know, he'll make a movie about a dragon flying around New York eating people's heads, and it'll make you think, how did you do that? <laughs> um, love him so much. Um Okay. So yeah, that's the I think that's a lot of yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. few. William Castle. I'm just getting into William Castle like fully. Okay. Um and he I think is one of the great filmmakers of the middle of the 20th century and he is not getting enough credit for it. Um but the, every time I like see a new William Castle movie and I've just like recently been introduced me, uh excuse me. Recently been introducing myself to Mr. Sardonicus and Let's Kill mm. Uncle and I'm like, "Oh my god, the dude was damn genius why don't we talk about him more every time we talk about william castle we tend to talk about his gimmicks but i think we forget that he was also a really good filmmaker yeah there you go and look if someone put out a stat what like uh, horror films only 18 horror films have ever been nominated over the 93 year 
history of the Oscars. And that'll tell you why some of these horror directors get forgotten mm. and what happened. They don't get yeah, I, 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 I've written a couple of articles like that, mm. actually. And sometimes they're like, a lot of people want to put like an asterisk on it. Like, was Silence of the Lambs really horror? And I'm mm. like, yes, he wore a human <laughs> face. How much more horror do you want? Just because you find him charming doesn't mean yeah. it wasn't a horror. No, film, he's but... a nightmare of a human being. Like, what the hell? So, like, no, that's true. There, there aren't a lot of horror movies that have gotten, like, a lot of credit from the Academy. And it's that's absurd. I think that's yeah. uh, nonsense. And, again, it's another thing that I became a critic to try to help with as as – I don't know, egomaniacal as that sounds, just try to make sure that there is a voice in the system saying, hey, these are actually like genuinely, these are yeah. art. And even well, if they're not, they're not always good art. Most things aren't good art. So there's a reason why we don't talk about most movies. Right. right. You know, but we, we talk about the ones that mean something to us. And sometimes they do, even if we're uncomfortable labeling them as great. Well, there are way worse self -re self serving reasons to become a director, so I don't think there's anything negative about that. Uh, Canada Rock says Amadeus is also one of my favorites. In 2016, I saw Amadeus live at the Sony Center oh. here in Toronto. It's the movie, but with a full live orchestra playing the music, wow. an absolutely incredible experience. God damn, I would have loved to have been there for that. I, I wish I could have seen that live. I think Sir Ian McKellen was in the original production, Ooh. and oh, God, can you imagine? Good God. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right, let's stop here because we crossed the hundred dollar mark. Uh, so hey. uh, please, Bibbs, uh, tell okay. your first story. Okay. So the first story that I'm going to tell you is a story of my other brother. <laughs> uh, so I was raised uh, in Pasadena, California, and uh, I had an older brother. He's like nine years older than me. So this is a oh, big okay. gap. We don't have a lot in common, and um, that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, but throughout my childhood. You know, I would, my brother would be doing his thing in high school. I'd be doing my thing in elementary school. And my parents would sometimes just refer to your other brother. And I was like, who? I, I have another brother? I was like, yeah, 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 you have, we have, you have another brother. And I'm like, oh, oh um, where's my other brother? And they were just like, oh, he's on the roof. He didn't obey the rules. And I'm like, what? And then every once in a while, they would just like, oh, I'm not going to finish the sandwich. And they'd throw it on the roof. Just be like, hey, this is for your other brother. Just gotta oh make my sure God. he's still up there. And they assumed I knew they were joking. I did not know that for a bit. Uh, and uh, my my family had this whole thing about throwing things on roofs. Like my uh, my dad, whenever he found like a garden snail, like a lot of people just crush them or use like, right. insect inside. Um, he would take it and he'd throw it on the neighbor's roof. What? And then uh, years later, they the, our neighbors redid their roof. And we heard the roofer going, what the, why are there so many snail shells? How is this possible? There's an apocalypse of snails. Um, I was still bad for those snails. But uh, in any case, yeah, so that was, that was this thing that wow. my parents assumed I knew was a joke. But when I was a little kid, I was just like, I feel bad for you, other brother. <laughs> I love this. Noam says there's a horror movie in this. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> It totally is. Um, it's not. As, I, I, I figured it out quick. Don't get me wrong. Oh, okay, I, I right. wasn't like I wasn't like living in terror of my parents or anything like that. There was definitely an element of whimsy to it, but it's kind of like Santa Claus when you're young and you're just sort of like, oh he's not God. real, or is he? <laughs> and that's how I felt about because every once in a while they'd still throw a sandwich up to him, and I'm like, no. <laughs> that's brilliant oh my god yeah. that's a great story uh yeah. all right i hope you all felt that was worth getting to a hundred dollars i love it yeah. we've got to if we get to two hundred dollars uh the gardenia incident is the oh. next story something oh. called the gardenia incident so you can help me to this day okay oh. Oh. all right Jeez. all right if we get to two hundred dollars so uh send in yeah. your support here ladies and gentlemen as we go along uh let's see let's uh hit some more of these because they're coming in fast and furious here uh i think i read this oh yeah here we go uh philly punt says love you bibs what are your favorite spielberg kubrick and scorsese films john are you going to cover children of a lesser god on the cinephiles I would love to because I fucking love that movie. Nobody talks about that goddamn movie, and it's one of the best movies of the 80s. And Marley Matlin, I will forever be in love with. She was gorgeous at the Oscars the other day. Uh, and it's the best William Hurt uh, performance, in my opinion, this yeah. side of Altered States. This side of Altered States is Old my statement. favorite movie. Yeah. Uh, but uh, favorite Spielberg, Kubrick, and Scorsese films. Uh, Spielberg. <sighs> 
Spielberg. I, I, I actually love Spielberg's like sort of less popular stuff. His popular stuff is great. You know, the Raiders and it's all really wonderful. Yeah. But um, a lot of the times, like his really cool stuff goes under the radar. Like I actually only just saw recently for the very first time. I just missed it when it came out. The Terminal. Oh yeah, the, the terminal. terminal slaps. The Terminal is a great movie Thank about you. like American bureaucracy and the immigrant experience. It's it's great. I love that movie. I, I cry um, every I also, time I watch that movie. We also every did um, uh, on our on our show canceled too soon, not that long mm -hmm. ago, uh, a TV movie he did. There was a backdoor pilot for a TV series with Martin oh. Landau. Uh, it's called Savage, and it was really? about a sixty minutes type reporter played by Martin Landau who is investigating uh, a, a future nominee for the Supreme Court. Like someone died. And they need to get a new Supreme Court judge, and they find out that he might be compromised. And it's a really good TV movie. Interesting. Uh, it's really well shot and everything. If you can track it down, I highly recommend it. Um, it's hard to find, but it's worth it. Yeah. Um, so I like a lot of his like lesser known stuff because he really puts all the effort into everything he does, and I feel like that stuff is kind of just cool to support. Um, Kubrick, my favorite Kubrick film is Barry Lyndon. Uh, you're gonna I, you're gonna have to explain that to me because I okay. I fell asleep. 30 minutes in, oh my God. and I've never oh. revisited it. What do I care about a, a white dude rolling around with rich guys in fucking Victor Victoria? It was 1700, 1800, whatever it is. It's, it looks boring as fucking. I love Kubrick. Mm -hmm. So yeah. tell me why I should give this thing a shot. Your, 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 your question was uh, why should I give a fuck about like this rich white dude uh, and in the past? And that's the point of the movie. <laughs> the point of the movie is who, who the who gives a fuck about this guy? Like everyone, <laughs> like in history, has like this big vaunted opinion of themselves. Here's this guy who like lucked his way into everything. All uh -huh. he ever was was rich, white, and lucky, and that's it. And then we're gonna make this huge, big. Someone wrote this big, giant novel about him, and it all boils down to this last title card. And um, okay, I, I'm not, I, I just the title card is basically just. But who cares? He's dead now. And it's just this great setup to this amazing punchline. Okay. Also, I will say this. The duel at the end of that movie is one of the most suspenseful pieces of cinema I've ever seen. It's him and against his son, isn't it? And he's yeah. taking uh, on his it, son at the end? It's, okay. it's, his, uh, it's uh, his stepson, but yeah. Stepson, okay. Um, but yeah, that, that scene is All just right, incredible bibs. cinema. So I love that one. Uh, and right. Scorsese. It's hard to pick Scorsese because I love a lot of Scorsese. I would Ooh. say probably my favorite Scorsese is probably from a personal perspective, I'll say The Aviator because okay. he knows what buttons to push for me in that movie. I'm a big, big fan of like golden age of Hollywood stuff and like all the times when like we meet like old actors and we see them making uh, right. uh, the old movies. Um, I'm just like, oh, thank you, Marty. This is all wonderful. Mm. Um, but other than that, probably Casino. I think Casino is a really unappreciated oh. film. It's, it kicks ass. I, I hated Casino when I saw it the first time, and as yeah. I've gotten older, I've really appreciated that movie and gone mm -hmm. back to it. It's actually addictive as hell to go back to and watch that movie. It's great. It's, it's got amazing energy. It has the best voiceover gag I've ever heard in a movie. Um, <laughs> if you know if you know what I'm talking about, you're going to laugh like John Roca is. If you don't, watch the movie. There's an incredible voiceover <laughs> gag towards the end of the film. It's like oh. Chef Kiss perfect. Um, oh, he's a funny filmmaker. Good. People don't give him enough credit. He's very playful. So. That's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah. All right, Aaron Clister says, Bibbs, you just sold me on that version of Phantom of the Opera. Yay! Uh, is there any way you can come to my local theater and give an introduction like that, please? I'll buy all the soap you have. Thank you for the response, sir. Well, uh, that's a lot of soap, and you can find it at Salt Cat Soap. It's our Etsy store. You go to Etsy.com, look for Salt Cat Soap, all one yes. word. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Salt Cat Soap. Uh, but uh, I would love to do that. Uh, I've presented a few movies. Uh, oh, we cool. did. Whitney and I, uh, my podcast co-host, Whitney Seibold, we hosted a short-lived midnight movie series over at the New Art. And oh, nice. We, we did some, we did, some, I don't remember everything we did. We we did Hackers, which was huge. People just loved going back to that movie. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think we sold out the house that night. We did Hackers. We did Galaxy Quest before that was, like, as popular a cult film, I think, as it is now. I think we were on yeah. the... I think we're just ahead of the curve on that one. I think we did Speed Racer, and we really wanted – it was frustrating. We really wanted to get The Mask of Zorro. Oh, yeah. Uh, and for some reason, there was, like, a lot of pushback. Like, are people really going to want to see The Mask of Zorro? And I'm like, yes. That movie is fantastic. Yes. Show them The Mask of Zorro. Uh, but I love hosting movies. I love – Getting introduced movies, you know, I grew up watching Turner Classic movies in AMC mm. back when it stood for American Movie Classics, and um, 
the introductions by folks yeah. like Robert Osborne, um, I think they're I think they're vital, especially if you're not, not watching something really contemporary. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. need to get a little bit of context. You need to understand why is this worth watching now? Why of all the films in history are we watching this one tonight? Yeah, and you don't want to give the whole game away. You don't want to ruin anything, but you just want to get people in the mood. You want to make sure they know here's what you're in for. Here's the yeah. right angle at which to fully appreciate this now. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's a great art. I think a lot of the best film critics can do that. Uh, I try to do that. Thank you very much for the compliment. And uh, yes, I would love to uh, host movies anywhere, anytime, especially if there's money involved because I am poor. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would I would love to do it. There you go, Aaron. Help me, I'm poor. Uh, Justin Toner says, Bibbs, like you, I love Alfred Hitchcock. He's my favorite director. First, what was the Hitchcock film you saw that made you a fan of him? For me, it was Rear Window. Second, what are some of your favorite Hitchcock films? Growl, growl. Growl, growl to you, too. Um, My first Hitchcock movie was the one that made me go, oh, I want to see every Hitchcock movie. Uh, I was, uh, I had to be, I had to, I, I was... I left the school in like fourth grade. It was like towards the end of the year and it didn't make sense to like drop me into another school with only a month to go. So for like a month, my mom was a teacher. I was homeschooled. And uh, part of the education experience was we're going to make sure that we treat old movies the same way we treat old books. We're going to make sure that you have a working knowledge of them. So we started working our way through the classic section of our local video store. And, um, and I love my mother for this. She's this every, the reason I'm here right now is my mom. I'm sharing funny stories about, my parents i love my parents they were great i just want to make that clear and uh there was an initial day when we rented the first one we rented citizen kane mrs miniver and uh strangers on a train Mm -hmm. that was their first day i was 10 and i loved every single one of those movies strangers on a train is it reads even to a 10 year old, like everything about it just works. It's incredibly wow. thrilling. It was a great gateway. Uh, nowadays, my favorite Hitchcock movies like Rear window is, I think it's arguably his most perfect film. I think there's just no flaw in it. Wow. I love okay. her window. Uh, Rear window shadow of doubt uh, is another one that I think doesn't get enough love. It's great. Trouble yeah, with Harry is really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Family Plot is highly underrated. It's considered like kind of a disappointment because it's the last movie. But if the Coen brothers made that movie now, it, it would be up for Best Picture. Like it's just <laughs> that good. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, a lot of them are super significant, obviously, but they're not necessarily my faves. Um, beyond that, I want to talk about. Um, I recently, actually, only for the first time, saw Jamaica Inn, which nobody told me was about pirates. It's got Charles <laughs> Lawton, and it's about pirates. I thought it took place in Jamaica. It does right. not. Uh, but that was a really, really cool film. And a lot of his early British films are really, really exciting. Uh, yeah. I will take the Pepsi Challenge with the original The Man Who Knew Too Much over the Jimmy Stewart version any oh. day. That movie is a lot of personality, a lot okay. more interesting characters. It doesn't feel like it's beholden to a specific genre. And then my other favorite is The Lady Vanishes, which I just think is just incredibly witty and funny. Yeah. Uh, th- for, on my side, I'll throw in 39 Steps. I, and we didn't even mention yeah. Vertigo, which I, to me, I I love that movie. It never, it's not above Citizen Kane, as some, some survey tried to put out a few years ago. But it's an incredible film about the obsession like you're not supposed to like jimmy stewart ladies and gentlemen by the end of the movie if you like jimmy stewart by the end of the movie you're doing the movie wrong Mm -hmm. he's an incredibly it shows you the manipulative nature of man when it wants what it wants from a woman and how he can remove a woman's agency for his own selfish desires and drive her mad and ignore the one woman who is willing to be with him uh and you know uh, uh, be by his side no matter what he goes after this fantasy like most men do because they're not emotionally capable of understanding that the fantasy actually isn't real and and you you manipulate and twist the fantasy to fit what you want it and then shatter it all to pieces so, yeah. yeah i think vertigo is a, I, I admire vertigo i think more than i like vertigo and mm. i think the thing with vertigo i think is i think calling it the greatest movie ever made i think is a bit of a mistake not because it's not sure. good but because you can't start with vertigo yeah right i no. think i think you need to watch like at least a decent number of hitchcock movies before you're going to understand yeah. what vertigo is getting at about hitchcock himself and as a result uh, that's really that's a lot of pretense and that's, that's, a, great uh, that's point. a lot to get through so yeah. i would never say vertigo is like the top tier hitchcock because you need to see all these other hitchcocks in order to get it but once you do i do appreciate it a lot yep yep uh, uh what's the other one? Oh, yeah lifeboat nobody talks about lifeboat lifeboat's fucking brilliant lifeboat kicks ass 
Yeah. Lifeboat's yeah. a wonderful film. I, I just recently rewatched The Foreign Correspondent. Oh, um, and that yeah. movie held up a lot better than I thought it would. And that movie is really great. It's about um, Joel McRae plays an American reporter who's sent to Europe to sort of keep an eye on the storm brewing uh, in Europe. And this was at a time when America was trying to avoid getting involved in World War II. Right. Uh, and it's all about how you can't do that and how you actually <laughs> need to make a stand and actually like, and it's actually incredibly relevant today. And it's really yeah. a great film. I like that movie a lot. I agree. I'm going to, I'm waiting for the criterion set to go back on the 50% and pick up the rest of them uh, to have in my collection. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I had money, money. Wouldn't it be great? Uh, but yeah, I, I, I love those movies. Great. Alan Smithy says, Hey, Bibbs, Hey, Roca trivia question. Who directed never ending story Two? Thanks. Ooh. Actually, I do not know. Too, so I, I don't know too. I don't know too. I'm gonna be honest. It's probably is it was I don't think is that a, is I don't that know a, actually. If that would PJ ever ask that, that's a hell of a five point. That's a, that'd be a hell I think PJ would it. give you context on that. Like right? which Oscar winning filmmaker or which filmmaker who worked in a major action movie franchise, like I feel like you need a little context on that one if it was gonna be a five. Might oh be my like, god, who it's was George it? Miller. <laughs> Holy shit. Wait, the George Miller? Or, the, there's two George Millers. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. There's, uh, there's another Australian filmmaker named George Miller who didn't direct The Road Warrior. Oh, right. No, the yeah, the guy who did The Man from Snowy River. So it's yeah. the other George Miller. Yeah. Oh, it's the other George Miller. Yeah, okay. Wow. We we recently we did a, a, an episode of Canceled Too Soon where we uh, reviewed a failed pilot for a Road Warrior-esque TV series Ooh. starring... Um, Oh God, um, Miguel Ferrer and Sharon Stone, and yeah, back in the eighties. And Miguel Ferrer plays a robot, some generic Michael Pere looking dude is like the mm -hmm. lead, and then Sharon Stone plays their boss, and it's like this dystopian desert landscape. Everyone's driving around in cool cars. The stunts are amazing, and we're like, "Wow, George Miller directed this!" And you can totally see it; it's amazing. And then we looked at it on IMDb. A different George Miller did this. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. That would be like finding some other guy who happens to be named Steven Spielberg did the National Treasure movies. You can't, <laughs> I, no, I thought you the DJ didn't allow that. So wow. Well, okay. this is this is Australia. So oh, okay. maybe it's different. Okay. Maybe yeah, it's different. Maybe. Maybe you never joined, so you could yeah. just make them in Australia and send them overseas. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, George T. Miller says Scottish Australians, and maybe there's a couple of different things he's got to work with. I don't know. A couple of the films he directed: Andre, that one with Tina Majorino and the Seal, and yeah. uh, Zeus, Zeus and Roxanne, the Steve Gutenberg film. So I, I don't dislike Zeus and Roxanne. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cute little film. I got nothing against Zeus and Roxanne. All right, man. Yeah. Uh, one last one here. Doug Develop says, I know Oscars wins aren't like sports championships, mm -hmm. but after Sunday night, who's doing your Mount Rushmore for best or favorite actresses working today? To me, it has to be Streep, uh, Francis McDormand, Kate Blanchett, and uh, Davis. Dina Davis? Hope Davis? Who are you trying to say? Betty I Davis? I don't know. I don't, know. Um, I don't think they ever gave a bad performance. So, all right. The uh, Bibbs, thoughts? Uh, my favorite actors working today, a lot of them, I mean, listen, you, you, you try to tell, try to pretend Meryl Streep is a bad actor. I dare you. Yeah. You're not right. going to do it. She's, she's, she's incredible. Um, my favorite actor, I think, working today is actually Rebecca Hall. Ooh. I think Rebecca Hall is a really impeccable. She she gave what is my favorite performance of the decade okay. uh, in a film called Christine, yes. which is the biopic about Christine Chubbuck, who, if you don't know her story, I'm not going to ruin your day by telling you, but she had a very tragic life. Um, yes. And uh, that is a movie that I think understands uh, mental illness mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. than most movies I can think of. Okay. And she gives a performance that is full of dignity and sorrow and self-hatred and ego. And it's a lot of complexity. And I think it's great. And I've, I've, every single time I've seen her in anything, even in that really crappy Will Ferrell Sherlock Holmes movie, she's breaking Oh, it. God. It was a terrible movie. Yeah. I mean, in Godzilla vs. Kong, she and Skarsgård doing such an incredible job in saying these lines. And you believe them. Yeah. Like, you I, believe I believe them. her. I don't know yeah. if I believe All Skarsgård. Right. But fair, fair enough. enough. <laughs> Fair enough. She's good. I always liked. I liked in the trailer. One of the first things I'm like, oh, this might be good. Was when she put the emphasis on God in Godzilla. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. It's Godzilla. It's it's Godzilla. And I'm oh, like, thank. Put some respect on that name. Yeah. If we're gonna. If we're gonna. If we're gonna completely warp the original actual Japanese name 
for this for this character <laughs> at the very least give it some dignity so thank you i, I think you she's, i think she's fantastic she's probably my number one favorite but there god knows there's no shortage of amazing actors out there so that's, that's true the first one that comes to mind agreed uh yeah. we're at 130 dollars ladies and gentlemen if we get 70 more we get the gardenia incident story before bibs leaves uh, i know he's on limited time just, so ladies and gentlemen start I, donating I stay a little longer you can I can stay a little okay. longer if you want. Right, right. I can stay a little longer. Yeah, uh, I would love but, that. Oh god, the Gardini story. Oh, <laughs> People, oh, look at a pitch of this thing. It's, it's, send it's in. Sucks. Okay. Uh, Arturo Zamorano says favorite Peter Berg movie recommendations for movies like One Night in Miami. Um, uh, my favorite Peter Berg movie, I think, is Deepwater Horizon. I know Lone Survivor okay. is great. I know these other. Uh, films are good, but for me, that's the one that works for me. Very Bad Things is fucking fantastic as well. I'm actually, uh, their Shout Factory put out last year a Blu ray of Very Bad Things, and me and Whitney Seibel did the commentary track for it. Oh, nice. Uh, so if you want to check that out, you absolutely can. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I, I Peter Berg is a director I'm not huge on. I think he can be very, very good, but he can also be very workmanlike. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of his movies where I'm like, you look at something like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of like, uh, well, like what the hell did he do? Like Lone Survivor is fine. Yeah, it's fine. Lone Survivor is fine, but um, hey, none um, of that. I'm like, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I don't know. I'd say probably my, my favorite of his is Battleship because it at least has a sense of humor. Oh come on, not Battleship. Battleship dude. is fun. What are you talking about? I had a good time in Battleship. Now you're just doing that. Now you're doing that thing you do. What about the rundown? The rundown was fucking good. The rundown is fine. I got it doesn't take itself so seriously. Come on. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's just, what, so if you critique Jimmy, do you don't critique Gavin O'Malley for murdering Elster's wife and setting up Jimmy as a patsy? Sure, they did, but he's still a fucking creep. Both things can exist at the same time. One of time. them is a protagonist and one of them is not. And exactly. therefore, a, a lot of people want to immediately like give uh, a lot of empathy or sympathy to someone just because they're the lead in the film, but that's often right. a mistake. And I think Jack was playing with that. Yeah, Jared Leto's big boner. Thank you for that. Uh, all right, let's see here. Uh, let's see if we got any more that have come through real quick. Sean Barrett. Oh, thank you, Sean. Sending in some uh, some support. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. That puts us at 164. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're close. Get, let's get up to that 200. Let's bring in some people live to ask you some questions here, Bibbs, if you're cool with it. Uh, Justin Toner, what's up, bud? How are you? Hey, guys. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, it's nice to finally get to meet Bibbs. It's like I've been... Yeah. I've been a fan of it for a while in the show now, so it's really nice to have you here on the Outlaw Nation tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for answering the Hitchcock questions. It's like I've been recently trying to catch up on going through some of his films um, that I haven't seen yet. I just recently sure. watched uh, Rebecca, which I thought was amazing, and um, Frenzy, which I, I hadn't seen either one of them. I liked oh, Rebecca yeah. more than Frenzy. Frenzy wasn't too bad, but I can see why people have a fun with it because it, it's – it gets uncomfortable with, hmm. with the, some of the stuff and the content in there, but it wasn't too bad. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to check out Family Plot still because that was his last film. Um, yeah. There's a couple others I still need to check out that you mentioned, like Shadow of a Doubt. I still haven't seen. Um, wow. Uh, I'm glad you guys brought up the like uh, his early British stuff, like Lady Vanishes and 39 Steps. They're two right. of my favorites. Yeah. Um, well. Well, I wanted to ask about. Um, we got okay, just to let you know, Justin. We got twenty minutes, so we yeah. can't take oh, too much time, time on this. Yeah, yeah, sorry about go, that. Go, yeah. Go, 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 go. Oh, yeah. yeah, so my my question is concerning Argento. I just started trying to get into Argento because I haven't <clears> really watched any of his films. My friend of mine showed me uh, Suspiria for the first time a couple months <clears> ago in four K. It was I was blown away. It's, I'll bet. Um, so I've been trying to figure out which one to watch next. Um, he's recommended some as like what would you recommend is probably one of the next ones to go to because it's like a look at like deep red or, or like um phenomenon with jennifer Connolly. so it's like yeah. i haven't figured out which one to go to next in, in uh, that's a great question uh dario argento is uh, a filmmaker who a lot of people their first introduction to dario argento is suspiria and suspiria is amazing but it's actually a little atypical of his filmography he only made a couple of supernatural thrillers there was that one mm -hmm. and if you like suspiria i highly recommend inferno inferno was really really great yeah. that's Equal, mm -hmm. uh, Mother of Tears, not so much. Uh, so <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't race into that one. Uh, okay. But uh, if I were you, I would actually just kind of maybe go back a little bit and look at his early Giallo films. Now, if, if, you're, if anyone's unfamiliar with a Giallo, it's an Italian uh, mm -hmm. genre of horror that combines detective movie tropes and slasher movie tropes before slasher movie genre had really been codified. Yeah. So it's basically detective stories with really violent murders. Um, and he made a string of truly excellent ones. I would say either start with Deep Red, uh, yeah. which 
is I think maybe his like ultimate movie. Like it's definitely the one that like has all of his uh, predilections in it. Um, yeah. I'm a huge fan of his first film, The Bird with Crystal Plumage. Um, I think that movie's truly excellent. And uh, okay. it's this movie's really messed up, but it's it's really good. I would also recommend uh, a slightly later film of his, Opera. Uh, which is yeah, just yeah. Opera's with- been recommended to me by my friend as well, yeah. and he also recommended yeah. um, Deep Red as well. I mm. uh, the the one you just mentioned, his first one, that's coming out uh, in like 4K soon. From oh, great! Europe. Yeah, that's exciting. So it's like, yeah, I'll definitely probably check. I'll probably check out Deep Red and then and get to some of his other stuff. So cool. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Yep. Good see you. All right, let's move on uh, real quick. We got some that have come through, so we're close. We're about ten dollars away from that Gardenia incident, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get to it. And 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 Bibbs has got to go here in the next uh, uh, fifteen minutes. So make sure you send in if you can. Rondo Calrissian says, "Don't know if either of you like Stephen King adaptations. I'm halfway through the Dark Tower books and heard Mike Flanagan wants to direct a live action series. I think he's a good director. Also a huge King fan. Would you be interested in seeing that? Also, what is your favorite Stephen King adaptation?" Oh, uh, I actually love Stephen King adaptations. I've I've seen every theatrical Stephen King adaptation, except for a couple that were done in India, which are really hard to find over here. Mm. Uh, I've also seen most of the straight to video uh, like sequels of things. Um, okay. I've written a bit extensively about it. I did a web series about Stephen King. Um, I think some of the best movies ever made, flat out, uh, have yep. been Stephen King adaptations. Wow. Um, I think probably. It's hard to it's hard to deny The Shining. I think as the best, even though it's arguably unfaithful. Yes, uh, but, and King hated it. Yes, but but you know what? I think um, I think the reason why King hated it is because I think King, as a struggling alcoholic, connected with Jack Torrance mm. as a, as the protagonist of the book, and I think Stanley Kubrick was more interested in the perspective of the wife and child that he was either subtly emotionally and then eventually actually physically abusing. No, and I think no. that's one of the reasons why, you know, you, Oh, we changed the topiary animals to a hedge maze who gives a crap. I think that's the fundamental difference. That's and I one. really love what Dr. Sleep did, which is it suggested that both King's adaptation and or both King's, sorry, both King's original story and Kubrick's adaptation were true simultaneously that mm-hmm. The Shining, the movie, was a story from the kid's perspective, and The Shining, the book, was the same story from the dad's perspective. And so I really love Dr. Sleep. That's shooting up my ranks. Um, okay. I'm trying to think maybe what my other, like, couple of couple of faves are. Any love um, for Carrie? Any love for... Carrie's, Carrie's excellent, but Carrie is definitely a version of that story told by a guy. Um, okay. And that's, yeah, I right. think that, and I think what that movie does well, it does incredibly well. And I think what it does not so well feels like a seventies grindhouse movie more than it should, I think. Okay. Um, but I do admire that movie. I think it's mostly great. Um, let's but see me. here. The dead zone is oh, fuck pretty yeah, much impossible. Uh, pretty, yeah. not impossible. Impeccable. The dead zone yeah. is, is not talked about enough. I think it's truly one of the ultimate examples. I um, I did. If you, if you look it up, there's. I did an article for the Wrap like a year or two ago, like when the Pet Cemetery remake came out, where okay. I ranked all of the theatrically released Stephen King adaptations from America. Oh. Um, so you can look at my overall thoughts, and some of those might be up and down more than you know whatever, but it's all subjective. So, okay. um, but if you want to get my detailed thoughts on Stephen King movies, it's all there. All right, James Alexander says, "Bibbs, what's an outline to use when watching a film to study it and review it? For example, what is good acting? How to tell if uh, the story is actually good? Themes." Okay, uh, that is the big old can of worms, and that's you basically just act asked what is film criticism, and yeah. it's a good question. It's a great question. I just can't give it to you in two minutes. Um, yeah. Uh, so here's here's what it boils down to: uh, when you're studying film criticism, if you want to review movies, uh, you need to. No one, no one's expecting you to know everything about movies because it's impossible. You just mm-hmm. can't. But you have to remain uh, curious and you have to be excited to do the research. Um, so f- watch as many movies as you can. Understand the context as best you can, especially if it's for an older movie. Um, know enough about movie making that you know the terminology. You understand um, how and why various creative decisions would be made. Um, But what it boils down to, once you get those kind of nuts and bolts baselines, uh, what it boils down to is you need to have enough knowledge of how movies are made, why creative decisions are made, and what other films exist within the framework of the movie you're reviewing. Like, say, for example, you're reviewing a new Halloween movie, you're reviewing Halloween Kills. 
you should have at least some sense of the slasher genre so that when you're mm. watching a movie, you under, you can figure out what is the filmmaker getting at? Mm -hmm. What are they going for? How are they attempting to tell this story? Are they trying to make you laugh? Are they trying to make you cry? Are they trying to just do the genre straight? Or are they trying to undermine it in some way? And if so, what are the cues? And so ultimately what it boils down to is, do you have the, the, the information necessary to suss out what the filmmaker is getting at? And then when you understand what that is, do you know whether or not they succeeded for you? Like, yeah. did they did they do a good job at it? And if they didn't do a good job at it, you have to point to the reasons why and be able to say they did this and ultimately that was ineffective, or they did this and it worked beautifully. There you so go. that's the best I can do in a short that, in a short. That's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Very kind of you to, to tell to tell them that. All right, we crossed the two hundred, but we got to get through these real quick, and then he okay. can tell the story as maybe a last <laughs> final thing. Uh, okay. JJ Winward says underscore Winward says, "Hey all, a few months back I watched Portrait of a Lady on Fire and loved it. Yes. From there I've started going back and watching more French films like Vive Sa Vie and Belle du Jour. What are your favorite French films? Uh, growl Growl." <laughs> Uh, my favorite French film, and it's one of my favorite films of all time, is Cleo from 5 to 7 by Agnes Varda. Good choice. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's a truly incredible motion picture. Um, it is about a young woman. I think she's a singer. She's definitely a performer. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of the movie, it's 5 o'clock, and she's waiting on a diagnosis. She's mm. sick, and she's waiting for the doctor to tell her if she's going to die or not. And then the rest of the movie takes place over the course of two hours as she tries to fill her time. That might sound a little boring boring but Agnes Varda makes it incredibly alive and there's so much living you can do in two hours in a way that doesn't feel like hokey or twee or some like feel good American film it's actually like really immediate and incredible and boy howdy I wish everyone would see this movie so please check it out yeah I would throw in Breathless who I, which I absolutely fucking love I would throw in uh, uh, Les Samurai I would throw yeah. in uh, what's uh, and I would throw in two of the Depardieu ones that from the '90s or, or like that. Uh, his Cyrano de Bergerac is one of my favorite mm -hmm. French films ever, and uh, All the Mornings of the World. Two, oh, two, I've two, seen two, that one. Julie Mouton du Monde is fantastic. He, his awesome. son stars as a younger version of himself, yeah. and he's telling this story of how he started to become this master music teacher, and he's in a full depression at the beginning of the movie, uh -huh. and he goes back to try to rekindle his love of music. Phenomenal. With the same actress from De Bergerac as well, so just uh, great, great stuff. Real fast, The Umbrellas yep. of Cherbourg is one of the great movie musicals. It is French, and you don't need to know French to appreciate it. It's incredible. Is that the one with Kelly in it as well? As well as Deneuve? Is no, right Kelly is in the Young Girls of Roche 4, which oh, that's is the sequel. It. That's uh, it, but bad. the original, is for me, is where it's at. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, the Schmote Law 70 he says, did Bibbs pull an Oprah and withdraw from free-for-all MVP contention? Bateman played well, but most of the heavy lifting was done by others. Have either of you reviewed a movie a Schmote and competitor was in? Uh... Uh, I've never reviewed a movie that a fellow Schmodown competitor was in after <laughs> I knew them as a friend. Like, for example, I, I, I'm i on a team with Brendan Meyer, and he was recently in that adaptation of The Color Out of Space. Yes. I wouldn't review that, even if I felt like I could be honest about it, just because it would look like a conflict of interest, and I think it's fair to that to say so. So yep. Yep. there's that. Um, and uh, what, what was the other question? Oh, uh, what was the other question? It was about oh yeah, um, MVP, MVP contention. Should uh, you MVP. Been... Yeah, well, we don't uh, want to spoil it. It's still pay per view. No, no, no. I, I will say this. I will say this. Uh, if you look at the rule book uh, for the Schmodown, the I, F free for all. I, yep. I'm Go just ahead. Say, I'm just gonna say the free for all. Uh, the MVP award is not specifically codified as you need to do these things in order to win the MVP award. True. The MVP award is subjective. It is decided by the judges. And I think every, arguably every single year, there's at least a couple of people who would arguably be in contention for it. We can debate who should be uh, 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 the winner. <laughs> all we want i think that there's a i think there's actually like three or four people who are like perfectly good candidates this year yes um, and it goes beyond how many points you got it also means like what was your impact on the game how entertaining were you what how surprising were you um and so yeah we can we can debate if you want i'm fine with that but it is what it is and it's it's not like any it's perfectly reasonable to say that the person who won MVP won MVP. Yeah, you can say yeah. that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. So, how much time do you have, brother? Do you have time to do? I got. This? I got five minutes. Okay. Do you have, uh, how long is the story? Is it five minutes? I can, I, can, I, can, I can do it in less than five. Minutes. Okay. Let's do okay. it. 
All right, so uh, it is the early 90s, and there's a show called Beavis and Butthead on television. And <laughs> for those of you who weren't around when Beavis and Butthead came out, they were controversial. Yes. They were these teenagers who were saying awful things and like being really immature and talking about sex and violence and fire. And uh, I knew that everything they did was controversial. And there was this one episode of Beavis and Butthead that I'm watching this, and for some reason, Beavis starts screaming out, Gardenia! Gardenia! Now, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. So I go up to my parents, and I'm again, I'm a kid, and I was like, hey, mom, dad, um, I have a question about a word uh, that I heard, and it was used in kind of a, a sort of controversial context. Um, what does gardenia mean? And my parents, the, the timing on them is incredible. They look at each other, <laughs> nod, and they look at me, and they say, where did you hear that word? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I was uh, just heard it from school. Like, no, where did you hear that word? That's the worst possible word. I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And like, they're like, they like, go to your room. And I was like, <laughs> what did I say? I don't know what gardenia means. And they came in later and they were just like, did you really not know what gardenia means? And I was like, no, I have no idea. And then there's a brief pause and they're like, okay, if you're still interested in a week, we'll tell you. And I'm like, what the hell does Gardenia mean? <laughs> I wait patiently for one week. One week wow. I wait patiently. Wow. And then I finally go up to them. And I'm kind of like, I'm nervous because last time there was such an emotional reaction. Right. And I walk up to them like, hey, guys. It's, and I waited to the minute. It was like 730 at night. Guys, um, it's been a week. And uh, you said that if I came back in a week and I asked you uh, what Gardenia meant, uh, you would tell me. So would would you please tell me? And they were just like, it's a flower. And I'm like, <laughs> that's it? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, why didn't you tell me that? And they were just like, we assumed you would look it up. It's in the dictionary. We thought wow. we thought you'd figure that out. And I'm like, no, you said it was a, it made it seem like a naughty word. They don't put those in the dictionary. They didn't back then. Yes. And so that was the whole thing. And um, to this day, Every time I hear the word gardenia, I wince a little. Like, ah, they got me again. They thought That's it was awesome. hilarious, and in retrospect, it was. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so you got two minutes. You got to go, my man. Uh, yeah. I have. Okay. All right. Sorry for everybody who's waiting live uh, to come in. We we don't have to. Uh, Bibbs has got to roll. Um, all right. All right. No, no, don't sweat it, brother. I appreciate yeah. the time you gave us tonight. An hour and 40 minutes. Much respect. Much mm -hmm. love. Uh, Bibbs, uh, please promote everything you got. Uh, talk about okay. everything you want to you want to let people know about. Okay, sure. So uh, if you if you're not familiar with me, uh, uh, it must have been a weird couple of hours for you. But thank you for joining. <laughs> me. Uh, I host a series of podcasts at the critically acclaimed network. Uh, we're on we we're where you can find podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever. Um, and uh, we uh, we host a lot of shows on that podcast network. It's not just one show. There's the critically acclaimed show where we review new releases. Uh, there's We've Got Mail where we answer email from our listeners. Uh, we have a show called Cancel Too Soon where we review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. Uh, some of the most epic failures in TV history. Um, we have a show called Episode Zero where we talk about the prehistory of pop culture phenomenon. We talked about uh, 20 films that influenced Star Wars before it got made. And now we're in the middle of uh, talking about the various films that influenced the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, other things as well. We're over at Patreon. We have patreon.com slash critically acclaimed network. We have a lot of exclusive shows, including a show called Holy Batman with a W, where we're reviewing every single episode of the 1960s Batman series. We have a mm. show called All Our Yesterdays. We're reviewing every single episode of Star Trek in production order. John yep. Dalplot Roca was on an episode, and we're very grateful have. for it. We're in the awesome. middle of the animated series from the 70s right now, which is surprisingly Ooh, good. It I love it. The yeah, series, don't think it talks yeah. about it. It's real nice. It's an excellent yeah. show, so we're very, very excited to sort of bring it out there. We have a show called Only the Best, where we're uh, uh, we're reviewing every single film ever nominated for Best Picture. We do commentary wow. tracks. We just did one for Batman and Robin. Uh, we do a show called Not on Disney Plus, where we talk about uh, movies that Disney owns but mysteriously are not available on the streaming service, and maybe why that is. Um, and uh, yeah, we're on Twitter at Critic Acclaim. I'm at wow. William Bibiani, and more importantly. More importantly than any of that, boy, are we selling some soaps. So you head on <laughs> over to Etsy. Go to Etsy. Trust me on this. Go to Etsy. Look for Salt Cat Soap, all one word. You will find a wide variety of soaps, most of which 
handcrafted with exquisite craftsmanship by my wife and partner, M. Lapis Da Silva, who is also an author. Please check out her thriller book, Hooker. Came out last year. Great reviews. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have a wonderful variety of soaps and a variety of different uh, uh, styles. Uh, this one looks like a lion. I designed that one. Uh, That's awesome. This this is uh, uh, these are shampoo bars. These are actually let me. I'm trying to even get there. You can see yeah. we have like a soap stamp on there. Real real nice. And uh, by all means, check it out. We have a lot of wonderful stuff there. But also check us out on Saturday because on Saturday we're releasing a whole bunch of new designs, a couple of new products that we've never released before on our Salt Cat Soap Etsy store. So follow us along Salt Cat Soap on Instagram and Twitter for updates, maybe even some deals in the future. Boom. There you go. Well, let's jump in. we just spent an hour and 40 minutes with the great William Bibiani. I can't thank him enough for being on here. We talk Shmana. We talk Gardenias. We talk stories, families, movies, horror. We talked about it all. So if you're just tuning in a little bit later, we'll wind back and, and, and watch that whole conversation as well. But Bibs, thanks so much, brother. It was great to see you. Great to catch up. Um, oh, and uh, I wish you the best, brother. And um, I, I look forward to the next thing you're making and the next thing you're writing for sure. Much love, man. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. Take care. All right. Take care. All right. There's William Bibiani. Had so much fun having him here on the show for the last hour and 40 minutes. We've got about 20 minutes left in the show tonight. I'm exhausted. I've had a long day. So if you're waiting to come in and talk live, just know it's just me. Just regular old the outlaw hanging out. Bibs, uh, Bibs had to go early a little bit. So, so uh, you know, we thank him very, very much. Yeah, we were going to talk a little MCU, but unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to get into it. People were sending great questions, great comments, and I'll always defer to the people who send in donations with their questions first before I get into any of the subjects that I want to get into uh, for sure. So uh, we do have I do have one that came in for me. I imagine Solshar1999 wants to know, what's your take on the whole Super League situation, brother? I'm fascinated to hear an American's outlook on it whose father was a soccer nut. Much love. Yeah, my dad definitely a soccer nut. So I can tell you uh, right now, in my opinion, uh, I, I think the teams did all the right things by pulling out the English league teams. They under the Premier League teams. They understood the situation. They, I mean, their fans reacted in such a strong, strong way. Uh, they pulled themselves out of this situation because, uh, because of the reaction from the fans and the reaction I think from the other clubs in the Premier League. And then of course after that, all after all six went out, three more the other clubs went out, and there was like I think and then there was one that came out, and then there was two left. So there are still two clubs. I think it's Barcelona and one of the other clubs who is determined to somehow make this happen. I understood the reasons. It was all about finances and what have you. So I understood why they're doing this. But yes, at the end of the day, definitely a money grab, definitely a power grab. I have started to see more and more the American approach to this. A lot of people are complaining about, which is that these le these these teams, the twelve teams in the Super League, or eleven teams, eleven to twelve teams. They would permanently be part of the league for 20 years, and they would bring in four to five teams, depending on how many permanent members there were, uh, and those teams could be relegated for other teams. Uh, and if you if you're if you're one of those uh, 12 teams that are like secured with a spot, you could be worse than the other teams. Yet you won't get relegated. A team that does better than you can be relegated uh, in that situation. And I thought that I think that's does not smack of any real level of competition in my personal opinion. So I think the right things happen. I think they turn, but don't think this is over, ladies and gentlemen, because this has been brewing since 2018, probably a little bit before that, but this was just when they finally decided to take a stab at it, which I think was horrible timing because of uh, COVID and all of that. There's not even fans in the stadiums in England. There's barely any fans in uh, Germany and Italy and other places in Spain watching these matches. So to have these clubs do a power grab and a money grab, it really spat in the face of these fans who are so desperate just to be in the stadium, just to be able to watch football at numerous towns across all of Europe. So it was a bit of a slap in the face to all those clubs. And so they rightfully so got absolutely vilified and pilloried uh, overall about this situation. And it's done for now. But in no way do I think it's done forever. And I will say this. There's a bit of hypocr hypocrisy here amongst clubs like Everton and all these, you know, who are 
you know, launching these massive statements about how they love their fans and they would never do it. Bull fucking shit. If you saw the money and you were as good as Liverpool, which you'd never fucking be as good as Liverpool, if you were as good as Manchester United, Manchester City, or even Tottenham a little bit, you'd have jumped at this chance to make more money and you fucking know it. So don't delude yourself if you root for a small club in the Premier League that somehow your owners would have never done something like this. Bull fucking shit. All right. There's, I'm telling you that right now. If money's involved and you're a premier team and you've got to go play on pitches that are subpar to what you're used to or in stadiums that aren't the best, then you're going to make a move that's going to make you more money and keep you financially solvent. No owner buys a team to lose money. It doesn't make sense. It's a business. You know, I say this about the movie business all the time. Uh, Perry Nemiroff and I used to have battles about this on our shows all the time at Collider it's not about art it's about business if you create great art as as a happenstance or as a side byproduct great but at the end of the day these people who own the movie studios they only really care about making money yeah and that's what it is at the end of the day they want to make great movies because that could lead to great money but in the end it's about making the money it's show business not show let me stroke your hair it's show business you know that's my thing at the overall at the end of the day. All right. That was my thoughts on that. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, let's bring in a couple. Let's bring in Royko. What's up, dude? How you doing, man? How hey, you feeling? John. How's it going? Good, uh, good. What's you know on? what? Uh, I'm okay to have you by yourself. It's okay. Yeah, worry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's, uh, it's all right. I only had you know. so much time Bibbs could give me tonight, but you know. But you know what? That's fine. I but appreciate anyway. what he could because I know it's tough. Maybe people are busy. Yep. Oh, I love the conversation, but which is yeah, one I want to bring it back because one of the things you guys talked about was like uh, uh, reviewers uh, and uh, you mm. may be liking some uh, films that uh, reviewers uh, didn't like and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, I've had a couple experience like one was with a casino where I was expecting not to like it because the reviews weren't that great. They weren't. And yeah, they weren't. That. And yet I'm going, this is fantastic. And and I had the uh, exact same experience with the thing because I rented the thing on oh, VHS. Yeah. Uh, could, oh, and history. honestly, the critics that I that I trusted, like uh, uh, Siskel and Ebert, hated it. Right. Mm -hmm. They both hated it. And I was like, what the hell were they talking about? So what films... Uh, uh, maybe before you were in the business, uh, like uh, that got horrible reviews, and you went to see, and you went, "What the hell were they talking about?" <laughs> well, I th I think what uh, Bibbs mentioned, the Terminal. I think with Spielberg, I've never understood why people hate that movie. I I think that movie is, is such a powerful st uh, um, uh, statement on the immigrant experience, uh, and what the what he goes through all over. That film is uh, is uh, very moving, and at the end, when near the end, rather, when uh, the gentleman from those Wes Anderson movies, the Indian actor, oh, yeah, he yeah. goes to the plane with the broom or the mop to try to stop the plane, uh, that devastates me every single time. Uh, you know, because he so he so cares about this situation, he so cares about Tom Hanks, he being an immigrant himself, an older gentleman is willing to think like, like Tiananmen Square almost, where one man can stop a bunch of tanks, here's one man trying to stop a plane so that his his uh, friend can uh, get out of this situation. So it's just like, it's very, very moving stuff overall throughout. The Terminal is one of those ones. Uh, what else have we spoken about already? Um I don't know. What, what, what do you got? What else have you got besides Casino? Uh, well, the other one, uh, this one, I may be the only fan of this movie, uh, but I absolutely love Ghost of Mars. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> everyone hates it. Carpenter's, yeah. uh, all the critics hated it. Carpenter's fans hate it. I think even Carpenter hates it. But I love the friggin' movie. It's like, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, you know, there was this thing... Um, you you may be the 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 greatest fan of this movie if and it's like that's one of them where I, I think I'm the only if not the greatest fan of that film, oh. right? Because everyone hates it. Have you seen it? It's it's like everyone hates. Yes, it. I, I I saw it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's as bad as people say uh, it is, and so I totally respect uh, the fact that you enjoyed the hell out of it. And I don't understand how people say negative stuff. What do you hear mostly about when they speak negatively about that film? What do they touch on? Oh, well, the first one is uh, how derivative it is, uh, especially of Assault on Precinct 13. Now, that didn't, because <laughs> it basically is, it's a remake of Assault on Precinct right. 13 in space. But I, I mean, they don't give crap about other, uh, um, they didn't give Hitchcock crap when he remade, you know, uh, 
his films or um, yeah. with, with some of the other the directors that we made. Uh, oh, uh, Frank Capra, we made uh, two of his films. Right. Actually. right. Uh, and there's a, like, so uh, to me, it's like, okay, so he wants to do the same story again. Big deal. The other one is that, um, uh, that it was like slow and stuff, but I loved like, there's something about Carpenter's pace when he's deliberate that I absolutely, and the one, the other one I don't understand is the bad acting. Cause okay, maybe yeah. it was a little bit over the top, but I enjoyed uh, the bad acting. Like Ice Cube is absolutely phenomenal, and Jason right. State, a young Jason Statham, that yep. uh, that still looks fifty, but um, uh, and I just love this one joke because there's always the character in the films where you know it's this brash like over the top uh, guy who's a bit sexist and he's always hitting on the girl. He goes, oh, the world's ending, let's have And it never works. In this film, it worked. And I right. laughed for five minutes straight when, when she said, yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but how, about, how, how about Constantine? People bash Constantine I all love the time. Constantine. The reviews are negative for Constantine if you look them up. And that's a goddamn good movie. And so many people went after Constantine when it came out in, what, 2005? People yeah. went after that thing, and it is actually damn good movie. So I well, don't understand I was, the hate for Constantine either. I was unfamiliar with the uh, uh, with the source material. I wonder if that's why I like it more because everyone's saying it's nothing like yeah. the source material, uh, which is what like uh, a lot of people that initially hated The Shining, I think, yeah. also said that it's nothing like the source material. Right. I I didn't have any. Um, I had no clue about the Constantine comics. And when right. I saw the film, yeah, that's another one where I expected not to like it because everyone yeah. I was like, no, this is, I love this movie. And the ending is one uh, like one of my favorite endings of where Peter Stormare coming, oh, yeah. maybe I'm ruining it, but Peter Stormare coming out as the devil. is He's great. I, I mean, look, Stormare is in so many of those. Oh, Stormare, is that how you, I well, That's how I say it. I don't know. Yeah, if yeah. It's, but like, I'm sure someday I'll listen to how he actually says it, but I hope it's Stormare. <laughs> but I, but I, 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 you know, he is so good as the devil when he comes out and he's got the whole like, ah. <sighs> You know, all of it, it's so believable what he does. And so is Tilda Swinton. She's fucking fantastic in that movie as the is Archangel game. Has she him. ever been bad? Even in bad movies, yeah. she is by far the best thing ever. Like yeah. people talking about the greatest actresses living today and no one talks about Tilda Swinton. And I swear to God, I will watch her do anything. Yeah. There's something about her. Like I, I um, like, uh, uh, was it the, um, uh, uh, the train movie. Oh my God. Um, Which one? Uh, the 2013 uh, Bong Joon-ho. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, 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 train to Busan. Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, you're talking about Snowpiercer. Sorry, Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer. Oh my God. I can't believe that I couldn't pull that. Yeah. But anyway, so Snowpiercer, I remember I knew nothing about the movie. I had no idea who was in it. It just came on and I was like, oh, that's Tilda Swinton. And I'm like, holy crap, she's amazing. And oh, oh my God, uh, that's Octavia Spencer. It's like, yeah, the, I thought this was like a no nothing, and then I was just blown away by like, yeah. So uh, Tilda Swinton, uh, uh, by far one of the greatest actresses working today. Yeah, so to bring it back to like, I don't understand why she's not in everyone's conversation. She should be up there because there's just something different about her. Yeah, uh, that's why I loved her when she was in Doctor Strange. I thought she's fantastic in Doctor Strange for sure, and what she played, uh, you know, what she was able to create there. I thought she was brilliant in Doctor Strange. Well, kind of elevated that film completely. And I know some people gave her shit, uh, gave shit because it wasn't a person, yeah, of Asian uh, descent, which yeah, I yeah, understand. Yeah. I get I, it. I get I, it. I don't really put, and I, I know people might get mad at me for saying this, but I don't really put Tilda Swinton in a ethical, in a ethnic category. She is like somehow beyond that kind of um decoration or that kind of label she's such an unusual person who has played both men and women that's, in the film so i just oh. don't put that kind of thing on her like orlando if you've never seen orlando well, i have and uh, and orlando. and yeah. uh, not uh not to mention suspiria like, yeah i, right, I don't suspiria. get it why they cast her as that like i'm still trying to figure out what the theme was but holy crap was was she uh, i swear to god after a while i forgot um i forget the character's name but the doctor yeah. It's like I forgot it was Tilda Swinton after a while. Yeah, like, it's uh, great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, 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 no. Uh, so, uh, but oh, since you bring it up, before I go, so about yeah. that whole representation, um, yeah. I totally get that representation because when I was a kid, um, there like 
there was very few representations of like immigrants or like yeah. uh, or or people from my end of the world like uh and uh, so one of my favorite movies growing up was Force 10 from Navarone because they oh, yeah. go to go to Yugoslavia and right. then I remember in the 90s I went to see all these movies that were really bad movies but they had like uh, the bad guy were Bosnian yep <laughs> Uh, and oh, wow. I was like, so that made you connect to the situation. Yeah. It's like, so yeah. Yeah, I totally get it. People that are going to see movies. Uh, now they're derided. Like, for example, like you were talking about yeah. uh, Hispanic representation when we were on a call before about, uh, um, was that the uh, Hollywood, um, Beverly Hills Chihuahua? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah the bad representation. But uh, I totally get it why people flock to the movies, even if it's bad rep representation, because it's still representation. Yeah, at the time, uh, you take what you can get, but there's better to be had out there for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I totally, I totally understand the people who want representation because now, I mean, I, I, I'm a white guy, but still, uh, I was an immigrant and I didn't see that. Like, right, right. Uh, yeah. now, now you do. So, anyway. Exactly. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Rico. Good no, to thank see you. you. I appreciate any time. Definitely, brother. Good to see you. Uh, all right, see Arturo's up. Thanks for Royco for coming in. Uh, one of my patrons there. That's what you do when you're a patron of the Outlaw Nation. As you see there uh, above my head, they're a patron of me, uh, John Roca, aka the Outlaw Nation. Uh, you get to come in and ask your questions here during these Outlaw Nation shows uh, and have them answered. Arturo Zamorano says, "How do you think Manchester will do against Liverpool? I guess he's putting the points there, six seven to fifty four on Sunday. Have you seen the movie Goal? What is a good soccer movie? I saw Goal. It wasn't my cup of tea." Uh, as much as I tried to like it, it wasn't my thing. Uh, I definitely, The Damned United is maybe one of the best soccer films I've ever seen with Michael Sheen and Timothy Spall. Uh, uh, they are doing a small sliver of Bobby Bobby Hoff's life as a manager. Or Bobby, is it Bobby Hoff? Yeah, I think it's Bobby Hoff. Uh, his life as a manager uh, for Leeds United after he'd been a manager uh, uh, there in the game for a little while against as one of the as one of the managers of the rivals of Leeds United. How that debacle of him going there, what that led to uh, overall. So if you haven't seen that, Michael Sheen is incredible. Or is it Nigel Clough? Oh, I'm sorry, it's Nigel Clough. He's playing Nigel Clough. So uh, his son. I remember his son became a, a, a manager as well. That's a, definitely a damn good one. There's one with uh, um, David Tennant. About I think it's called United about the plane crash where uh, a number of Manchester United players died uh, back in the, I think the sixties or the seventies. That's a damn good film. I think that's on Amazon Prime or Hulu for people to watch as well. I know. Oh, Brian Clough. Thank you, Sochar. Brian Brian Clough. I was getting confused there. Uh, yeah, Pele victory. Uh, I saw victory on the way back from London uh, a couple of years ago. It still kind of holds up, I suppose. Uh, but it's not the it's not the greatest movie about soccer. I would say even Mean Machine, which is a soccer version of The Longest Yard with Vinnie Jones as essentially the Burt Reynolds character or the Adam Stanley character, if you like the remake, that's another fun soccer one uh, for sure. And of course, uh, oh, it was a bend it like Beckham is a good one uh, uh, for uh, for female soccer as well. So there you go. Those are some suggestions. And I think man, I think Manchester United is going to be. Probably three to one, you'll end up beating us. We can't score, and we look terrible, and we don't have any life in our offense at all. Mane and Firmino have been terrible on the front line. Salah is the only reason we're remotely in these games. We should have beaten Newcastle. Uh, I think we tied against uh, someone else the week before. Uh, Drew, sorry. And we should have won both those games to keep us in content. We'd be in top four right now looking secure for a Champions League spot. And now we're on the outside looking in and it's not looking any good at all. Uh, let's bring in one last person. Aaron Clister. What's up, dude? What's going on? Hey, John, man. How you doing, brother? Good, brother. How are you? What's up? Oh, just got off work and I'm tired and smelly, but thank God you can't smell through the camera. Um, <laughs> So as always, right. I would like to give you a couple of topics to talk about. I love you to, oh, okay. to, to, to pick. So either okay. I can't think I can't think of another one. Um, so either Tom Hardy or okay. oh, fuck it, Born Trilogy. Uh, I would say Tom Hardy every time. Thank What's up, God? Because I don't want to talk about something I hate. So <laughs> my question is, what do you think okay. his best performance is? Because I honestly think, and, and I've gotten I've gotten to okay. many almost fist heated arguments of. I think Warrior, no pun intended, Warrior is a, he is so fantastic in that. Joe Edgerton is a great, great actor as in, you put in mm -hmm. Tom Hardy there and you kind of like, who gives a shit about this guy from Philadelphia? 
who the hell was that guy? And then like that same year, you saw him in in a in a oh my goodness in a Inception and in and in, 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 then you know everything else he did with Nolan, which is I guess just the uh, Dark Knight Rises. But after that, right. people started to pay attention. Yeah. At the same time, you can also make an argument. Bib just said something about you know you're with a, just somebody for two hours. Lock. That's mm. the that's the other that's the other movie my friend was talking about of just like man, it's just him. Just yep. him looking in the mirror, and you understand everything he's going through. At yep. the same time, somebody from the military, we can understand that I'm that person. I'm sure you've known that person that someone yeah. who got kicked out of the military and blames themselves more than anything and was like, I will put literally my body through hell just to make some kind of amends. And you yeah. totally understood that. Watching it when it came out in theaters to 10 years later, I'm like, that is me yeah. without the muscles. <laughs> but that is me. <laughs> you got muscles. You got muscles. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I get it. I, yeah, absolutely. I think Locke is one of his greatest performances for sure. But I think I'll always come back to Warrior, dude. I'm with you on that. There's just something about I mean, first of all, he's playing an American. Uh, uh, second of all, he's really kind of conveying. And, and by the way, Tom Hardy's never. I don't think he's ever served in the war or anything like that, or ever been in the military. But he seems. But he is carrying that uh, weight of it of having served, carrying that kind of. I would say latent PTSD that is going on with him, that he is navigating the guilt he feels, all of it, not wanting to tell the story, not wanting to reveal the facts of the story, uh, being kind of, how can I say this, being kind of ignorant, for lack of a better term, in thinking that this won't come out. The elements of this story won't come out before he does what he needs to do. Going to a high-profile uh, tournament, how does he think these these elements of the story that he's trying to hide are not going to come out. So he's lost in that kind of thing because he's so single-minded. And then that scene at the – I mean, the fight at the end is just so powerful and the reaction is so powerful. It oh, is yeah. him letting go of years and years of years of tension and anger and frustration and pain finally into the arms of a family member. And, of course, Nick Nolte's fucking stellar in that movie as oh. well. Right. Oh, um, when he's yelling his son when he's when he's just oh. drunk. That's the best I've ever seen him in. Yeah. And I love him in Tropic Thunder. So that I don't yeah. know if that says yeah. a lot or not. <laughs> yeah, but, no, I think he's great in Tropic Thunder. And it's also it's also like being comic book nerds, we know about the parallel universe theory. Yeah, of, yeah. If you stayed with your father and if you stayed with your mother, who are you gonna be? And I think right. that both of them you could if that person if that if instead of just brothers, if it was just one character. There you go. Those are your past. Which way you're right. going to go? It it right. it hits every point down to a T. So thank you very much for agreeing with me. Definitely, dude. Definitely, <laughs> I do a thousand percent agree with you. But I will throw in the Revenant. I think he's stellar uh, in the Revenant. And there's a small film. Oh, bitch. Forgot about there's, that. There's a small film called The Drop that he did uh, with Gandolfini and Numi Rapace from the original uh, A Girl with a Dragon Tattoo series. Uh, that's that is a slice of New Jersey. Once again, just conveying or New York, I think, just conveying this kind of Americana to him from different sections of, of the country. He's got an ability to do that, and, and the drop is just this quietly really good film where he delivers a stellar performance throughout. Never raises his voice throughout the whole time, just like Locke. Locke, he never once gets upset, raises his voice. He's just rolling through this situation, trying to navigate it as best he can. And he's stellar. Uh, and, of course, I will throw in Taboo, and I will throw in Peaky Blinders. If you really want to savor Tom Hardy as an actor, oh, yeah. both those series really show him uh, what he can be. Yes, he did play Picard's clone. Yes, he did. In Nemesis. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, cool. Uh, all right, Aaron, anything else? Are you good? What's up? That, that, that That's all, man. Um, okay. Uh, I I mean, let me get this out of the way. Uh, Bibs, I love. If you're gonna ever watch this again, I do love you. I'll I do respect it. you. But don't you ever count out Rushmore when you go up against a jam. Go ahead and say your jam and let Billy Batson become this jackass hero superhero. You can't <laughs> fuck with Rushmore. J T E and Broca all day. Thank you very all much, day. Broca. Thank you very much. Aaron. I appreciate the love, brother. <laughs> and thanks for being a patron, Anytime. man. Much love, dude. Peace. Yes, sir. Till next time. Uh, he's awesome. I love Aaron. He's such a great bundle of energy. And hell yeah, Rushmore. We got our first match this Friday. Uh, me and JT taking on the press room. That's Perry Nemiroff over there at Collider and Josh Horowitz 
over at MTV. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Not sure what we're going to get from Josh Horitz. We've pl I've played Perry before. She is a dangerous player for sure. She took out Kalinowski. You never know what it's going to be like when you take on Perry Nemiroff. So certainly going to be fun to see what we can do with the against them on Friday. Uh, and uh, I don't know if Shazam, I think, does it have to... Well, does it, is, is Shazam playing somebody soon? I thought since they lost the belts, we don't they have to play somebody to get back into contention. So I don't know what their uh, situation is, but certainly I'll be monitoring it in case we uh, get to uh, make an extended run in this tournament. Knock on wood. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I'm excited. I'm looking forward to playing with JT. It's going to be a lot of fun. Former tag team champion uh, JT. Me, a former two-time former tag team champion as well. So it'll be stellar. To, to get in the ring again and uh, i got a lot of faith in jt we got a lot of faith in each other and we'll see what happens all right let's wrap it up here thank you oh wait i got one more here doug developer said got teary-eyed watching the west side story trailer it was my parents first date movie back in 1967 and i'm excited to take them to see the remake 54 years later is there a classic film in which your parents first bonded over hmm I don't know that there is like my mom and dad didn't go to movies for dates uh, in this country. They met in this country, but I've never heard them like talk about a film together that they were in love with. My mom loved certain films and my dad loved certain films. So I was able to enjoy certain classic films with my mom that were different from the classic films I enjoyed with my dad. So I never saw, never saw them bond. But Amadeus certainly was one that my mother loved and my dad loved. So, and that was the eighties. So they'd already met, gotten married, had me, had all the kids before Amadeus came out. So not one that they bonded over before, uh, a class, uh, before they got married, but certainly one they bonded over while they were uh, married uh, uh, until my father passed away in 2008. So certainly a film that we still go back to, quote, and have fun talking about. And whenever I see it, I always think of my dad for sure. So there you go. But yes, West Side Story. I put up my uh, 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 teaser trailer reaction. Up, You know, I'm trying to do more of these reactions, trying to do more of these reviews, pushing myself to go forward, trying not to judge myself too hard. So I'm trying to make myself do more of these as the channel starts to slowly transition a little bit uh, uh, from uh, what it is now and to what it's going to be. So try to put more of that content out there for people to consume. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully you all enjoy it. And remember, everything we do here is on the Outlaw Nation Podcast Network as well. And uh, there may be plans for me to start moving some of these live shows and turning them into just podcasts to put up, to build the network up a little bit more, listening to Bibbs talk about the Critically Acclaimed Network. That is all just podcast, uh, and then leaving maybe some of the live stuff or just this and maybe in Polite Truths uh, or uh, this in the Star Wars show uh, and, uh, and then uh, the new show I've got coming out soon and then just focusing on reviews, uh, you know, uh, 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 videos about uh, certain topics and trailer reactions. So all that stuff kind of seeing the, the channel changing into its second year got some ideas so be on the lookout for that for sure uh but i can't thank all of you enough for tuning in tonight hope you enjoyed sitting down with bibs for an hour and 40 minutes talking about everything he's got going on in his world make sure you follow him on all the social media make sure you buy some soap for him make sure you listen to his shows as well and uh, cheer him on in the schmodown you know we've had an interesting road bibs and i from bitter rivals to now at least uh, a friendly, uh, friendly associates uh, uh, overall, and uh, I look forward to uh, to having him on the Cinephiles. And Matt and I should definitely do maybe have Bibbs on for one of our top ten live shows that we do uh, every other Thursday. Now, yeah, if you're a patron of the Top Ten Show, every other Thursday we do a live episode of the Top Ten. So you get it on Thursday, you get it ahead of time. We officially dropped the episode on Tuesday, but you can watch us live from 12 to about 1.30, 1.45 every other Thursday doing it live on our YouTube channel. You get an unlisted link and you get to come in and watch it. And I'll bring your comments on the screen sometimes or read them out uh, uh, as we're counting down our top tens. We've brought people in to play the bongos. We've brought people in to do the coin flips. It's been great. So if you want to get involved with that, you can go to the Patreon there as well. My Patreon, of course, is right below on the side there, patreon.com slash John Roca. Come get involved. We've been training for the Schmodown. We've been uh, talking about all kinds of subjects. It's a very lively discord for the Patreon as well. So come aboard for all of that. And uh, maybe you can come in with some suggestions 
for some shows you want to see from me as a patron of the Outlaw Nation. All of that, always wide open to all of it. So, all right, much love to all of you. Take care of yourselves. Please remember to follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, give some love to everybody in the world. No, Strong Style's not dying, Chris, not at all. Just kind of looking at new ways to elevate them, elevate them. So thank you for sure. Th that's the approach there, bro. You can never sit on your laurels, man. You always got to be looking at the new ways to, to change stuff around and make it more vibrant uh, overall. All right, thanks to Sean Barito for producing tonight and for lining up Bibbs as my guest. Much love to you, Sean. And uh, we'll talk to you all next time on another brand new episode of the Outlaw Nation Show next week. And please remember how remember what I say at the end of every show. I'm going to say it again. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever you need to do to get through the next second, next minute, next hour, next day, next week, next month, next year, I want you to do that. You never know what's waiting for you on the other side. It just might surprise you if you find the strength to stick around, how your life can turn around, how your life can change. Uh, I am a living example of that, and I just want to kind of pass that on to you all, that anything is possible if you can just keep fighting. Um, and we've all been, we're all on that battlefield and we all want to have all of you survive as much as possible. So much love to all of you. Hope you're getting vaccinated. Hope you keep maintaining your social distance and wearing your mask. I love you. Uh, and we'll talk to you next time on another brand new live episode of the Outlaw Nation channel next week where Wendy Lee will be my guest. So get ready for that for the May the 4th episode of the Outlaw Nation show. Bye. Thank you.